Good morning and welcome to the STS-111 Mission Overview Briefing. Our briefers this morning are, from my right, Rick LeBrode, Lead ISS UF-2 Stage Flight Director, Paul Hill, Lead STS-111 Flight Director, Mike Rodriguez, STS-111 Launch Package Integration Manager, and Chris Lawrence, Space Station Operations Manager of the Canadian Space Agency. Rick? Okay. Thank you, John. And uh, good morning, everyone. And Thank you all uh, for attending today. I uh, appreciate your support. Um, you all contribute a great deal to the success of this program and uh, through your efforts uh, of bringing our story to the uh, general public, and, and we do appreciate your efforts. Um, I think you'll find uh, this, this uh, mission very interesting as it really brings together pretty much all aspects of, uh, of international space station operations and, uh, and assembly. Um, We'll, uh, as, the, as the name that picks, uh, utilization flight, uh, we'll be doing a lot of cargo transfers using a multi-purpose logistics module, and Mike will talk a little bit more about that uh, when it's his turn. Um, we'll be doing a crew rotation. Uh, the expedition crew four, four crew will come home and we'll leave the, the five crew on orbit. Um, we're going to bring some new hardware to, uh, to orbit. I know you've probably heard a little bit about this in previous uh, briefings, and you're going to hear a lot more detail about it in, in uh, later briefings today, but uh, we'll touch on that. Um, but we'll be bringing the power and data grapple fixture that uh, we're going to put on the P6 solar array that uh, it'll be used uh, in a future flight when we, we relocate the, the solar array to its, uh, its permanent outboard location. Um, we'll be bringing the service module, the pre panels uh, on orbit. We're going to temp stow them, and then the Expedition 5 crew will, will uh, install those in their permanent location during a, uh, Expedition EVA during their stay. Um, then we have a, an assembly task. We're going to bring the, uh, the uh, well, I'm going to try and get this right. It's probably the only time you're going to hear me spell this out because it's a, it's a tricky one. Uh, the mobile remote server serve base system. MBS. That's how, I'm, and I'm not going to try and do that anymore. I'll let Chris uh, give give that acronym a shot when it's his turn. Um, anyway, that's a major piece of assembly hardware that we'll bring over it and uh, install on the mobile transporter, and will be used uh, to uh, for the uh, the Canadarm2 to operate from. And then uh, finally, we're going to we're going to end it with the maintenance CVA task, where we'll we'll uh, replace the wrist roll joint on the Canadarm2 and bring it back to its full full capability. Um, so you see, there's a there's a lot of activity. We keep everybody busy and uh, a lot for uh, for y'all to to talk about. Um, this briefing is going to be very similar to the briefings you've seen in the past. Um, we'll walk through uh, each of the flight days and highlight the the, uh, the high level uh, the the major activities for each day. Um, then we'll hand it over to Mike to talk about logistics, cargo, cargo transfers, and then Chris will talk a little bit about. Uh, about the uh, installation of the uh, MBS and then also the, the joint replacement of the Canadarm2. Um, before we get started, though, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the, the flight director team. You can see the first picture of the, on the station side. Uh, you see me. Uh, then on orbit two will be uh, John Curry. He's worked uh, multiple station assembly flights in the past. Uh, his last lead was, was STS-100. It was um, the 6A mission where we we delivered uh, the Canadarm2 to orbit. He'll be doing orbit two, and then uh, Brian Lunny is going to be on the planning team. This is his first dock mission, um, and you might recognize the last name. His father, Glenn Lunny, was one of the original Gemini and Apollo flight directors. Now, uh, so the uh, shuttle flight director team. Bring up the uh, shuttle team, please. There we go. Okay, uh, Paul Hill, the shuttle lead. Uh, she recognized Paul. He's worked just about every assembly flight that we have to date. Uh, his latest lead being on uh, uh, the STS-104 104 mission, the 7A, where we delivered the airlock. Uh, he'll support the Orbit 1 ship with me. Uh, Orbit 2 is going to be uh, Tony Sakachi. This will be his second uh, shuttle flight. He, uh, his first one was the Hubble mission, STS-107, I believe is what it was, uh, excuse me, 109. Uh, and then uh, planning ship's going to be Kelly, Kelly Beck, you've seen her, she's worked uh, multiple shuttle flights before. She's going to be lead on uh, the next flight, STS-107. Um, 
so you'll be seeing a lot of her in the future as well. And then uh, asset entries can be supported by John Shannon, who you should recognize. He's worked multiple asset and, and entry uh, flights. He was also the lead shuttle flight director on STS-102, uh, which was the 5A1, uh, 5A.1 mission. So let's see. With that, we'll go ahead and start pressing through the uh, through the flight days. I'll let Paul kick off with the first few. Okay. Let's see. Uh, from a shuttle perspective, this is a 12-day flight, and uh, while I would never call space flight routine. This flight does have the luxury of about a year's worth of flight experience on many of the facets that are peculiar to a station flight. So we should be demonstrating that we have gotten very good at the things it takes to make one of these flights happen. Flight days one through three are pretty standard for all these station flights. Flight day one, of course, will launch, do our first rendezvous phasing burn. Flight day two, we'll check out the shuttle arm, check out the suits, check out the docking system and the rendezvous tools for the next day. Rendezvous on flight day three with our standard R bar rendezvous. And we'll fly around to the, the forward part of the B bar and I'll fly up and dock to PMA two on lab forward. Um, at the end of flight day three, we will get the, the hatch open. The crew, the, the shuttle, and the new station crew will go inside, get their safety briefing. We'll swap Soyuz seat liners, uh, Soyuz entry suits, their cells set up to lead the new expedition crew. On flight day four, Ken Cockrell will use the shuttle arm. I think we have a video of this. Oh, I went too far. Here we go. Here's the, here's the rendezvous. And you'll see us come up from underneath, like I said, the standard Arbor rendezvous. When we get just below the station, Taco will do a short burn to fly around to uh, the forward part of the station, get there at about between 300 and 400 feet, and break. And then you'll see him fly right down the corridor and dock, like I said, to PMA-2 on lab forward. And this has been our standard approach starting with STS-102 about a year ago. And if we could go right into the next video, and you'll see where Taco will take out the, the shuttle arm, as I said, reach into the payload bay, I grapple the PLM, pull the PLM up out of the bay, go straight up, and attach it to node one meter. You have to imagine that now. <laughs> and that gets us through flight day four. And here we go. And while you see the SVS dots here on the PLM, we won't be using SVS. We have a centerline camera installed in the hatch window on node one, and that'll be our prime cue for attaching that PLM to the node. And at the end of that day, we will get into the PLM, we'll start some of the initial transfers, and then we'll start EVA preps for the next day uh, to get us ready to go out on our EVA on flight day five. And I'll turn it back over to Rick from there. Okay, thanks. Um, as Paul said, flight day five is the first EVA. Uh, Franklin and, and Philippe are gonna, first uh, task will be to install the power data grapple fixture on P6. Uh, they'll follow that with um, the tent uh, stow of the service module debris panels. And that the, once they're complete with that task, um, they're going to take the Canada Arm 2, uh, they're going to grapple the, the MBS in the bay, we're going to uh, keep a lot of power applied to it, and once we confirm we have good power to it, um, Philippe and Franklin are going to pull the thermal blankets off of the MBS. After that, the EVA will be completed, but uh, Peggy and Carl will then um, pull the MBS out of the bay and maneuver it up to the, pre the mobile transporter pre-installed position. It's about a six-foot distance from the, uh, from the berthing uh, interface of the mobile transporter, and we're going to leave it there overnight. Um, let's see, then we'll move on into uh, flight day six. The morning of flight day six, uh, Peggy and Carl will again uh, take the, the Canada Arm 2 and go ahead and finish the installation of the of the MBS on the BMT. And when I say finish it, they'll do the remote finish as far as the, there's a capture latch on the bottom of the MBS, it's called the MT capture latch. They'll just close the claws on the capture latch and they'll pull it uh, into a basically a mated position. Um, and then uh, the rest of that day we'll spend, we'll, the crew will spend doing uh, transfers uh, and then uh, we'll do uh, an EVA prep for the next day. And then we're also going to do our first reboosts on, uh, on flight D6. 
Flight Day 7, EVA 2, uh, it's pretty much going to be dedicated to outfitting the MDS. And the main objectives are going to be getting uh, cables reconfigured to now power the MDS from the MT, and then also uh, bolting it down. There's full bolts that uh, the crew will, will torque down and get in a good configuration, really to be able to leave it on, or, uh, on orbit in a safe config. Um, there's also some other activities, and, and you'll hear a lot more detail about that um, uh, in the EVA briefing later today. Um, in addition to that, uh, the, again, there'll be uh, some transfer ops going, uh, taking place, and then also uh, a lot of the uh, handover between Expedition 4 and Expedition 5 crew members. Um, now we're into Flight Day 8. Uh, we'll continue with the MPLM transfers, uh, crew handover, um, EVA 3 prep, and then um, we're going to do our second release for the mission. And um, Flight Day 9 will be our third and final EVA. It's going to be dedicated to solely to the replacement of the wrist roll joint on the Canadarm 2. Uh, in addition to doing the EVA, the, the expedition crew members will be doing a lot of transfers from the MPLM and then continue with their, uh, with their uh, handover exchange. And uh, now I'll pass it back to Paul. Let's see, Flight Day 10 will begin with uh, our third reboost period if required. Uh, we'll finish up the transfers into the PLM, close the PLM out, and then Ken Cockrell will again take the shuttle arm, grapple the PLM, pull it off, and put it back in the bay. And we have a video of that. And this is just a reverse of pulling the PLM up out of the bay and installing it on the node. Like I said, this is one of those facets that we have the luxury now of having done this several times. So uh, ideally, we'll, we will demonstrate that we've gotten really good at this. That will finish up essentially the dock mission. The next day on flight day 11, we'll close hatches and undock. We'll have a one and a quarter lap fly around, and we have a video of this. This also is standard, our, essentially our standard V-bar back out, standard fly around sequence. And you see Paul Lockhart will fly out to between 400 and 450 feet or so, then initiate a fly around in a clockwise direction here as we're looking at it. On a bad day where we don't have a lot of propellant for some reason, we'll, we'll stop up there at the top and separate from there. On a normal day, as planned, we'll continue all the way around, coming back around until we're above the station again, where we'll then burn our final set burn. And you'll see the orbiter go off to the right. We'll actually go off behind the station a little bit, then we'll drop down below and move out in front. And that'll start setting us up for deorbit. After that, the crew will get a much deserved half day off. Uh, particularly these transfer flights, we really work the crew every minute we have them available. So they'll be looking forward to the end of this day. The next day will be essentially dedicated to to entry prep, a little bit more off-duty time, and then we'll land on flight day 13. And that's everything for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mike, you want to pick it up from there? Certainly. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Rodriguez. I'm the Launch Package Integration Manager for this mission, UF-2, STS-111. Um, we have a very challenging mission ahead of us. Uh, we've overcome a lot of significant hurdles, uh, the last one being this recent addition of the wrist roll joint R&R, which we'll hear, you're, he'll, you will hear more about. Um, it was added to our flight roughly seven weeks ago, and it exemplifies the amount of cooperation that we've had between the NASA centers, the NASA contractors, and even our international partners. Um, I would like to extend my thanks and gratitude to everybody who has participated with this flight. Um, as Bill Gerstemeyer said in the previous um, briefing, uh, it, it truly is wonderful seeing all the people come together to put such a mission together, especially with the, uh, the challenges that we've had dealing with uh, the uh, international partners, uh, the, the additional of the wrist roll joint R&R, and uh, the various other tasks we've got planned. 
Um, I don't know if, if Rick and Paul realize this, but uh, I believe this is the first mission that we have the four big items that take place during docked missions to the space station. We will have a crew rotation on this flight. Uh, we will have an assembly activity with the MDS. We'll be performing logistics and utilization, resupply, and then we'll also have maintenance because of this uh, recently added risk role joint R&R. &R. So uh, this will be a very full and exciting mission, very complex. Um, we have a patch that we put together for the launch package, and I'd like to go ahead and run this video. Uh, you see here the contributions for all the international partners uh, involved. You see the Italians in the NPLM were docked to the U.S. lab destiny, the MBS in the upper left corner, and the very back of the payload bay, you can see the uh, Russian service module debris panels. Uh, we would have had a robotic joint in there had we had developed the patch later, but uh, that was recently added. So this does show a very good indication of the international national aspect of this mission. Um, what I'd like to talk to you in addition of the, uh, comp the challenges we have, I'd like to talk about the complements in the payload bay. Uh, we're flying a variety of different items and I'd like to go ahead and run a video to show you what the different items are. <clears throat> we have our standard configuration in the payload bay, the uh, orbiter docking system and the uh, shuttle uh, robotic arm. That's fairly standard for most of these flights. <clears throat> In addition, in the uh, Bay 4, you see the MBS, and I'll just call it MBS after Rick's mouthful of acronyms there. Uh, here it's abbreviated to the Mobile Bay System. We have the SSRMS wrist roll joint on the port side of Bay 6. This is Leonardo, the multipurpose logistics module. Leonardo's making his third trip to the space station. In the port side, Bay 13, we have the power and data grapple fixture, which will connect to P6 for relocation on 13A.1. And on the starboard side, we have the service module debris panels. This is the Russian contribution to this particular mission, which will be, start, sto uh, which will be installed on EVA-1. Uh, we can go ahead and run the tape again. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about each of the individual components. Let's just go ahead and run through it. Uh, we'll show stills of the items in the payload bay, and then we'll show some graphics as well. Okay, we've already seen this. We need to uh, go ahead forward to the, uh, the still of the MBS in the, there we go. This is the MBS in the space station processing facility. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can see the hardware. Uh, we have the Canadian flag and the U.S. flag. Uh, the MBS is basically an interface between the SSRMS, ORU's payloads, and EVA, and the MT itself. Uh, it's a work platform and really a base for the SSRMS uh, operations. I would like to show you a graphic now, graphic representation of the MBS. We can roll that tape. Okay, here's a graphic representation of the MBS. What you can see is four power data grapple fixtures. These support the attachments of the SSRMS. We have the uh, POA, the payload ORU accommodation. This is basically an extra latch end effector. It's good for providing power and temporary stowage location for payloads. We have the MBS common attach system, also a temporary stowage location for payloads. Payloads can obtain power and data interfaces using the MCAS UMA, the umbilical mechanism assembly shown here. Okay, rotating the MBS. More of the subcomponents. We have the Canadian RPCM, the Remote Power Controller Module. This is basically power switching between loads on the MBS. We have the uh, computer units, the brains of the M uh, MBS, providing control and monitoring and performing cellular management functions for the MBS equipment. And then we have the video distribution units, which obviously provide video routing. Okay, rotating again, you can see one of the uh, latch assemblies we have. This is the capture latch that we'll use to capture the MBS to the MT on flight day six, and then uh, we'll be screwing down four bolts to firm up the attachment to the MT. And I'm sure Chris will be going into more detail on this as well. And you can see here the uh, attachment sequence. Okay, let's go ahead and keep rolling the tape. Uh, we have shots of the uh, SSRMS wrist roll joint, a uh, shot I think you've seen before. Uh, this will be flying in uh, Port Bay 6. Uh, it's roughly 747 pounds with the uh, equipment that's flying up with it, with the, the joint that it's attached to. Um, it's the same shot that we've seen earlier. Okay, let's keep the tape rolling. Here's the power data grapple fixture. 
this is roughly 74 pounds uh, stored in the back end of the payload bay. This will be used to be attached to the P6 structure, the P6 array, and it will be relocated on 13A.1 uh, for uh, continuing the assembly sequence. Let's go ahead and press on and show the uh, service module debris panels. These are the SNDPs in the orbiter, in the orbiter processing facility. You can see them stowed in the uh, starboard side 13. It's roughly 109 pounds, the debris shields themselves. Uh, the uh, support structure is roughly 300 pounds that goes with it. Um, it is uh, a very intricate device, and it took a lot of cooperation between our Russian partners and the U.S. contractor and NASA centers to come up with an integrated product that we could successfully fly on this mission. Let's go ahead and roll the next visual. This is the debris shield in its stowed location after EVA-1. You can see the shield stowed on PMA-1 next to the MDM sunshade and tethered to the FGB um, with uh, some Russian tethers. And this is the final configuration after we complete EVA-1. Okay, next slide we have the multipurpose logistics module. This is Leonardo. Um, and I have a, a model I'd like to share with you right now, if we could. Okay, if we can show the model. This is Leonardo. We are flying with 15 racks. Uh, I believe this is the most racks we've had so far to date. We're flying five resupply stowage platforms. You can see here one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, the rest are resupply stowage racks, and they'll be uh, supplying the nominal um, stuff that we fly for crew rotation missions, crew clothing, crew food, um, EDA hardware, uh, we'll have utilization cargo, checks cargo, et cetera. Um, the, the ascent weight of the MPLM and all of its cargo is roughly 23,000 pounds. Um, its descent weight will be around 20,000 pounds. This is a very efficient flight. Uh, in addition to these racks, you see two purple racks over here. We have the express rack uh, coming up and the microgravity science glove box. Uh, these racks will be transferred over to the space station and uh, for use for the expedition crew members for their ex experiments. Uh, we are flying a significant amount of up mass of payloads and utilization items, uh, roughly 3,500 pounds of up mass. And again, this is, I believe, the most up mass of utilization equipment we've had. So we expect to keep our expedition crew members very busy during this increment. Um, in order to maximize the usefulness of the MPLM and in order to give the uh, expedition crew members a uh, good home to start out with, uh, we have been very aggressive in putting together a return plan to pack up the MPLM for return to the ground. Uh, we've gone to what we call a layered approach, which basically allows the crew to pack to a, a layer one level um, and then once they finish layer one, assuming we have a nominal mission, there's no concerns, no problems, we have time, they'll press on to layer two. Once they've completed layer two, they'll press on to layer three. And once layer three is complete, then we will have the full complement of the MPLM loaded. As I said, this will give the uh, crew members on board um, a much more efficient uh, use of the onboard stowage locations. Uh, we'll clean out some of the items that have been there for a long time that have needed to come home for a while. We'll bring home some excess foam and a variety of other stuff. Um, so you can see this is going to be a very uh, challenging mission, even though its main focus is uh, crew rotation and utilization. We've added quite a few uh, additional challenges to this mission, um, but we expect it to be very successful and uh, very exciting. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Next we'll hear from uh, Chris Lorenz, uh, Space Station Mission Operations Manager of the Canadian Space Agency. Chris. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Chris Lorenz, uh, and as mentioned, I'm the Space Station Mission Operations Manager for the Canadian Space Agency. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about Canada's involvement in SCS-111, uh, which will see the launch of the second part of Canada's contribution to the International Space Station program. Uh, that element is called the Mobile Remote Service or Base System, or more easily referred to as the MBS. So what is the MBS? Well, I'm going to ask the crew to roll a picture here that will uh, show you an aspect of the MBS as we talk. The MBS's primary purpose is to serve as a mobile operating platform for Canada Arm 2 and for the special purpose the switch manipulator once it is delivered. This will allow for greater operational flexibility while supporting EVAs or while moving large ISS elements along the truss. 
It also serves as a storage facility for EVA tools. Some of the vital statistics of the mobile base uh, are its mass is roughly 1,500 kilograms or 3,300 pounds. They can handle pretty much uh, 2,100 kilograms or 46,000 pounds. Uh, the equipment features of the MBS, uh, as mentioned previously, we have the POA, which is um, essentially a latching end effector with a couple of minor differences. And what it lets us do is to handle payloads or various structural elements of the International Space Station once they get delivered. Uh, another structural element is the MCAS, or the MBS Common Attached System, consisting of three V-guides and ready-to-latch indicators. And what this lets us do is get a firm handle on any payloads or truss segments there or elements that were moving along the truss uh, while we're conducting assembly operations. Um, the target, there's also a target which, uh, which lets us uh, burst the payloads into the, the POA and the umbilical mating assembly for uh, power data needs or whatever the payloads might require. Additionally, we have a, a CLTA or camera light pan and tilt uh, unit assembly, which is a color camera initially used for the installation of the MBS onto the MT, which is on the S0 truss segment. Uh, thereafter, it will be relocated onto the MBS mast, which will let us have a better overall view of the operations we're conducting uh, on orbit. Also, we have uh, four power data grapple fixtures, which are essentially uh, operating bases for Canada Arm 2 or for the SPDM. They give us access to power and data, as well as allowing us to send video signals uh, from the Canada Arm 2 or from the Special Purpose Text Manipulator down through the MBS uh, into the MT and then subsequently back into the main part of the vehicle. The first mission activities relating to the delivery of the MBS are really started on Flight Day 5 with the EVA-1, which focuses on pre-installation tasks um, for the MBS. Concurrently, CanArm2 will grapple the MBS in the shuttle payload bay and start providing power to it. On Flight Day 6, uh, the MBS will be mated to the mobile transporter by CanArm2 using the capture latch as we previously saw in one of the animations. Uh, this is a significant event for Canada, mainly because the first part of the staging contribution is installing the second part, uh, which is a pretty significant moment for Canada. On Flight Day 7, it's EVA2, which will finish the work of installing the MBS. Uh, we'll be making final connections for power, data, and the video. And as well, we'll be making sure that the, the bolts are driven to establish a firm connection between the MBS and the mobile transporter. Additionally, the EVA2 will see the deployment of the POA, uh, which is very, very similar, as I mentioned, to the Canada Arm 2 latching indicator. On Flight Day 8, uh, ground controllers will be conducting uh, checkout operations of the mobile data system from the ground, uh, first verifying, indeed, that the installation has been successfully, successfully completed. Uh, I'm going to move next into a, a very brief discussion on the, uh, the wrist roll joint replacement. Um, it's a, obviously an, an item of significant interest to everybody who would be watching the flight. Um, CanArm2 has had a very successful year on orbit. Uh, we've installed the airlock and its gas tanks. We've installed the S0 truss segment. We've supported the EVA for the first time directly with the CanArm2. Um, and now we're moving into uh, the next significant phase of assembly operations on board the vehicle. Uh, there have been some problems over the year, over the past year of operations of Canada Arm 2, but we need to keep in mind that the arm is uh, very, very different from Canada Arm, which is on the space shuttle. Uh, specifically, the fact that the Canada Arm on the shuttle is brought down after every flight for refurbishment that tends to let us have a different perspective on how we deal with any problems. Canada Arm 2, on the other hand, is specifically intended to be ma uh, maintained on orbit, which makes things uh, interesting and makes us operate in, in a different way. <coughs> Excuse me. The decision to replace the Canada Arm 2 wrist roll joint is a joint CSA NASA decision. And given that there are some very important missions coming up for the International Space Station Assembly uh, and that Canada Arm 2 is integral to all those operations, it was decided that STS-111 would be the best time to carry out the, the re removal and replacement. It should be noted that the, the decision again calls out the clear differences between Canada Arm and Canada Arm 2 where we're conducting the repair uh, on orbit as opposed to bringing it back down for re refurbishment. I'll leave the, uh, the really in-depth details of the VBA3 to my colleagues today in, in MLD, mainly because they're in a much better position to discuss the, the fine technical aspect of it uh, as, opposed to, as opposed to my expertise on it. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We'll start with questions here at Johnson Space Center. Uh, please remember to state your name and affiliation. Uh, Mark? Oh, Mark Corot from the Houston Chronicle. I think these are for Chris. Uh, could you, do you have a cost figure for the mobile base? I'm sorry, for the mobile, yeah, the mobile base. And it is Canadian for sure. Yeah. And, sa and same with the wrist joint. Uh, I have one for the, uh, for the MBS. I'm not, I don't have one for the wrist roll joint. For the MBS, it's 400 million Canadian, or about 255 uh, million U.S. And when do, you, when do you consider the, I guess the decision date that you 
wanted to replace the uh, the joint. I kind of remember the stretches back earlier this year to February, March, but I'm a little hazy when. I think that, I'm not sure of the exact date. Um, there were a lot of discussions, obviously, between ourselves and NASA to make sure that we were doing this on the right site at the right time and for all the right reasons. Uh, like I said, I don't know the exact date, but everybody sort of came to the consensus rather quickly that we needed to take this flight to get it done in, uh, in time for the rest of the flight coming up. Okay, Marsha. Marsha Dunn, Associated Press, with a few more joint questions for Chris. Um, do you have the dimensions of this joint? I think you gave the, the mass, but. Uh, How big of a, it looks big. It, look, it probably looks a little bit bigger than it really is. It's probably, I don't know, I mean, in terms of square feet, I don't really know. Maybe it's probably one and a half to two feet long, maybe one and a half to two feet high, something like that. Maybe a little larger, but not much, not, not that much bigger. And, and was this just sitting around a warehouse somewhere? I mean, can you talk about where this joint came from, and is there a replacement for all the joints um, on the arm, or how, how did there, there isn't actually a warehouse. It was actually at the original equipment manufacturer, MD Robotics, in Brampton, Ontario. Uh, and it was pretty much ready to go, waiting for the eventuality that we would have actually have to conduct a, a removal and a replacement. Uh, there are spares for, um, there's another, I believe there's another, or another roll. the way the arm is set up, there are two really different kinds of joints. One is a yaw joint and the other is a roll or pitch joint. And the roll and pitch joint are essentially the same. And we have a, a yaw joint uh, spare available and we also have another um, roll or pitch joint spare available. So we, we are ready to deal with, uh, hopefully we won't have to, but uh, ready to deal with any other uh, problems with the, with the joint. And you could put a wrist in a shoulder or a, an elbow right. or wherever it needs to be. Wherever the roller piss joints are, you can put that in there. Okay, it's not site specific in other words. No. Yeah. And what's Canada's best guess for what went wrong with the, the joint up there? What's the leading theory? Well, I'm not sure that there's, that there's one leading theory. I think we think that there's a, we're fairly certain that there's some kind of a hardware problem, but one of the reasons we want to get the uh, replacement done is to bring the joint back down and really troubleshoot it uh, all the way through to make sure that we find out what the problem is. Um, it's kind of hard to say because there are a lot of things the engineers would like to see that are just not possible to see uh, from, what we, from the data we can gather on orbit. So I really can't tell you that there's a leading theory. I think there are a couple of things we're trying to run down, um, but that's all I can say. Uh, Dave Santucci with CNN. If, uh, if you don't know what's wrong with it, um, are you just replacing it with the exact same piece or did you change the wrist roll joint in the new piece that's going up there at all? No, we're, we, we're, we're replacing it with uh, essentially an identical joint, um, mainly because we haven't really seen any indications of problems anywhere else. Uh, we're, we're of the opinion that this appears to be a one-of kind of problem, and we're going to try to resolve it uh, based on that. Obviously, uh, you know, it's harder to say it much more beyond that what, what we could really be looking at. I don't think we know, but I think we have a fairly high confidence that the arm itself is in pretty good shape. And this is not uncommon for other hardware problems that we have, you know. Failure is indeterminate, especially on space station where it doesn't come down regularly for, for the techs to get their hands on it and fix the problem. It's not uncommon at all for us to want to change out the extending piece of equipment so that we can look at it and see what went wrong with it and to determine whether or not we need to make some generic fix to the future hardware. Okay, I'm not sure who this is for, but um, the risk, the third EVA added, did that uh, take away from anything else during this mission or is this just uh, added on? Is there anything that was uh, taken out of this mission in order to accommodate? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, actually, it, it really didn't. Uh, we were looking at 11 plus, uh, plus one uh, mission scenario. Uh, where we had this plus one day to use at our leisure or as required. We were potentially going to use it to uh, accommodate uh, additional transfers from the MPLM. Uh, Mike spoke of the, of the layered effect or layered approach for transfer ops and we're going to use that day to complete transfers. Well, what we did when we decided to add this, this third EVA was we made it a 12 plus zero mission. And, and essentially made that the EVA day, and through uh, some fine tuning and pencil sharpening, we were able to find enough time uh, uh, to accommodate all the, the transfers that we'd, we require and, and also do this EVA. Okay, Ma, uh, I'm sorry, Marsha, go ahead. I had a quick one too, follow up um, for Mike. Um, the debris shields, do you know how many there are? And what they're made of and a little bit of information about yeah, them. I don't, I don't know the, uh, the composition of the shielding. Um, there are six shields that will be brought up to, to orbit on this mission. 
um, there will be a series of additional flights of additional uh, debris shields as we go. Um, as I understand it right now, the 1JA mission was the time frame that we were supposed to have all the debris shields in place on the service module based on the study that was performed. Um, but I do believe they're reevaluating that to determine if it truly is necessary. Um, once we're completed, I believe there will be around 25 uh, shields that will be installed on the service module for debris protection. Okay, Mark, did you have an additional question? Mark, any other questions? Uh, okay, Mark Perot from Houston Chronicle. Um, I, I, it seems from the, from the scheduling of activities on the mission that the, um, that the wrist roll joint replacement sort of comes last, but I know that's not always true in mission planning. I just wondered if, if something happened and you were looking at reprioritizing the flight or shortening it, uh, would you push to put on the mobile base or would you push to put on the uh, roll joint? I'll take a stab at that. Um, we, we did come up with our priorities uh, some time ago and with the addition of the wrist roll joint, obviously we had to retake a look at what we were trying to accomplish for this mission. Um, it is a very high priority for us, but because of the way the EVAs had been laid out um, and in order to maximize the training capability of the crew members, we decided it would be prudent to leave the EVAs as they were, and because of that, it laid out the wrist roll joint remove and replacement towards the last EVA. Um, in addition, we wanted to make sure that there was no problem with the R&R, &R, um, so we wanted to have a fresh and working arm that we knew would work prior to the actual wrist roll joint R&R. Uh, &R. So a lot of those um, ideas were brought into our priorities, and while the R&R for the wrist roll joint is a, a higher priority item, it's just by the way the flight plan was laid out, it comes on that 30 DA. Well, Mark, also we have looked at milestones throughout the EVA. So we know that if we have to truncate any EVAs, if we decide to truncate the flight, so we have a shuttle problem, we need to land early. We have plans and we bias everything towards leaving all hardware in orbit. That includes the joint. Uh, so we do have provisions for leaving that joint inside the station if we need to, say if we only go out EVA one time. But the goal is to leave all the hardware uh, and that also means leave the hardware survivable, which means we have to provide power to the MDS, either through the station arm or through the MT, which requires an EVA. And once you line all this up, uh, it does take you two full EVAs to get the MDS in a survivable configuration so that you can let go of it to then do the joint change out. But we've identified throughout all these EVAs where we would stop and just go transfer the hardware and make things safe. Just a quick follow-up on that. Can the expedition crew then do the wrist roll joint replacement if necessary, or could you hold it for another shuttle crew to do that later? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, they have been trained, uh, not to the same level as, as the shuttle crew. Um, it'll be quite a bit more challenging because you don't have the use of the shuttle arm to help them. But uh, they are familiar with the hardware and the, the tasks that are involved in doing the, the joint changeout. So the answer is yes. And we would plan on doing it during the stage um, prior to the next uh, the 9A mission. Do we have additional questions here at the Johnson Space Center? Seeing none, we'll move on to NASA headquarters in Washington. We have reporters there with questions, gentlemen. Tracy Watson with USA Today. So, Mike, can you be a little bit more specific about what kind of stuff will be coming back on the MPLM and where have they been keeping all of this uh, on station? Well, the, uh, the, the crew members have been very uh, uh, clever with where they've been stowing uh, a lot of the excess material. Um, unfortunately, as our EVA uh, rep uh, will come up and talk, we've, we've taken advantage of the airlock quite a bit as well with stowage location. Uh, they find nooks and crannies everywhere we can to uh, stow items. Um, stuff that's coming down, uh, it's a variety of things, uh, planned items that were being returned. Um, a bulk of it is packing material, foam, uh, bags, items that have come up on previous missions, uh, served their usefulness, and just never had a, a specific demarcation to come home. So we're kind of, as, as Bill said in the previous briefing, we're, do, we're doing a spring cleaning, basically taking an assessment of all the items on board that really don't need to be there. Uh, they've served their usefulness or they have to come down for refurbishment or whatever. Um, and so we're just compiling them all, found in locations inside the MTLM, and just having the crew uh, repack them inside the MTLM. 
So what kinds of things are no longer needed? Is it tools? Is it clothes? Is it food containers? What is it? It's a variety of things. Um, yeah, it's food containers. It's foam packaging material. It's bags. Uh, there are some items that need to come down for refurbishment. Um, it, it's a wide variety of things. It, it really ranges the spectrum. Uh, we're returning a uh, one of the robotics workstation monitors. Uh, we're replacing it with one we're flying up, bringing down another one. Uh, we're bringing down utilization samples for analysis. Um, as I said, it's, it's a wide variety of items. Uh, basically, it was just an assessment on board of all the things that uh, really isn't being used or had served their, their usefulness, and we're bringing those home. Uh, hi, Bill Harden with CBS News. Uh, just to follow up on Mark Caro's question, I understand what you're saying about mission priorities, but if you ended up in some kind of you know, minimum duration mission uh, scenario where you couldn't do all three EVAs, is your priority to put the joint on or is it to put the MBS on and do the walk off? And the answer is yes. Um, if we only got one EVA, we have figured out what that EVA would look like that would leave all the hardware in order, including the MBS and the joint, but we would not get the joint changed out while we were docked. We would defer that off either to this stage or some future stage once we decided we were ready to go change it. It turns out that the expedition crew that we're taking up will have some training on the joint change out. So if we decided we wanted to change it out before 9A, uh, we would have that option. Uh, it isn't clear to me that we would make that decision uh, right away. We'd probably take our time and, and assess the risk of, of going into 9A without the redundancy on this joint. Uh, but we would leave the MBS, we would leave the MBS powered up uh, as a minimum through the station arm, if not through the umbilicals, through the MT, and we would also leave the joint inside the airlock. So all the hardware in the bay would stay on board. Thanks. And um, just to help me characterize the, the criticality of replacing the joint, are there any construction scenarios downstream uh, where if you lost the string that, is re that, that works properly and you got into the redundant string and you lost wrist roll that you actually couldn't do something? I mean, is there is there a, a, one of those worst case scenarios where because of this problem you could actually get in a bind? Well, yeah, the conventional wisdom is now that you need this joint to continue to build starting with 9A and 11A. There might be individual RMS trajectories that we'd be able to position this joint manually and go ahead and press on without being able to articulate this joint. Uh, but for certainly for normal operations for any of the build outboard from where we are now, we need a fully functional arm. The arm we have now is fully functional on this string, but as you said, if we fail this string, that then takes us down to either one degraded string or depending on the failure, two degraded strings. Copy. And then my last question, uh, and I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but I think I confused myself listening to you guys earlier. The, the problem that you guys have in the string that you've lost the wrist roll, there's, there's nothing with the mechanical operation of the arm. This is strictly an electronics um, path, a uh, commanding path through the joint that the problem exists in. Is that right? Now, it is an electrical problem, we think, in the wrist roll joint. The rest of the joint works as designed, and we have a software patch that we can put on board um, that allows us to essentially mask this joint. Uh, the station arm ignores its presence altogether and can function fully on the other joints. All right, and the joint can also can be driven uh, by an EVA crew member with a, with a power tool. I believe that was our last question from headquarters. We'll move now to Kennedy Space Center for questions from reporters there. Hey, this is Elish on Earth News for Paul Hill. My standard questions, uh, how much ascent performance uh, do you have? Uh, I guess you addressed extension day. Is there any scenario where you might be able to get a milk out additional extension day? And for our launch week on May 30th, are there any uh, days there uh, and which ones, which would be flight day four only rendezvous attempts, and what would you do if uh, you ended up in that scenario on those days? Okay, it's the ascent performance, and I don't recall right now what the ascent performance number is we're booking. Uh, so I, I don't want to guess and give, give you a wrong number. We can get you an answer on that. But we do have good, good margins both in ascent performance and across the board on shuttle consumables. Um, I, with a caveat, and that is as far as the extension day goes, we don't have enough cryo margin, even if we launch on time on the first attempt, to build back another day, to essentially change this to a 13-day flight. Uh, we don't have it. Uh, we do have margin like Bill Gristemeyer talked about earlier this morning to transfer oxygen over the station, but it's considerably less than we would need to make back a day, and I don't expect in any scenario for us to save enough power in orbit to make that day back. Um, but we also have looked at failures that could happen, MDF scenarios, things like that, and we know how we could make, make capability back or which lower priority tasks we would give up in order to respond to them. 
Um, so that's not, a, that's not a big problem. Uh, we've done enough things in how we plan this particular PLM flight that uh, expectations are very high that we, we wouldn't need to extend just for the nominal mission. You know, we had a series of flights last year where the transfers went long or the assembly ops went long for some reason. Um, and we have taken advantage of the things we learned in those flights to make sure that that wouldn't be the case on this flight. So really the only scenario that would drive us into needing that extension day would be some failure. Um, if that happens, like I said, we know which activities are lower priority that we would delete in order to respond to those failures. Let's see, for launch windows, uh, we are still planning on May 30. May 30 has a day three and a day four pane. Um, because we don't have that plus one capability, um, I expect we'll be talking here shortly about whether or not we want to try that hard and launch into a day four rendezvous. Um, and I won't speculate now what the answer is going to be, um, but we will be talking about that as a minimum in, in the tanking MMT. And for the first four or five days worth of uh, launch windows, I think June 3rd is the only one that we don't have a day three opportunity. Um, and I would expect that our willingness to use day third as a launch day all hinges on whether or not we're willing to launch into day four at all. So I'll stand by and we'll be making a decision soon. Okay. Uh, now, the one obvious scenario I could think of which would really put a crimp in your plans, I'm certain that your sim sub has thought of, is what happens if you can't use Quest for some reason and have to use the shuttle airlock and have to close hatches uh, between each EVA? Can you still do all three EVAs and how does that impact uh, your transfer operations? We could still do all three EVAs, even from the shuttle airlock. Um, and depending on your perspective, we could accomplish the full mission. I would expect a significant impact on return transfers. Uh, so there we would probably leave all of layer three and some or all of layer two if in fact we had to conduct all these EVAs just from shuttle and we couldn't have the hatches open. Uh, and the primary, primary problem we have then, of course, would be that all the crew members that are supposed to ride home on shuttle, whenever we close that hatch for the EVA or for the EVA prep, have to be on the shuttle side of the hatch. So they're not available on station to be moving things into the PLM. As far as the EVA work goes, the assembly work, we could conduct all of that and from the outside it would look like it went along without a hitch. Um, Todd Halverson, New York Times for Chris or whoever might want to take it. Um, could you refresh my memory on how and when the wrist roll problem first reared its head and describe the symptoms in terms of degraded operations? I'm sure as best I can. The, I don't know specifically the, um, the day on which the, the failure occurred, but essentially what happened was uh, we were unable to remove the brakes from the, uh, from the string on which the wrist roll joint was operating, and that automatically caused a safety event and wouldn't let us come out of safety uh, on that string. And when you're safe, nothing's going to happen with the arm uh, because it's in safe condition, but it essentially means that you're not going anywhere with it. And the way we found the work around it was, as Paul mentioned, uh, generating a software patch to mask the joint altogether so that the control algorithm ignores the, uh, the existence of that joint. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's more or less uh, how we, we sort of determined it. And we did a fair, number, a fair bit of uh, troubleshooting to try to get some signatures on, uh, on what it was that we saw and what the, what the, the, the telemetry was telling us to then do a little bit more in-depth uh, troubleshooting to see exactly where the, uh, the problem may have come from. And that's pretty much where we are now. Thanks, that, that helps a lot. Um, a second question for you. Um, I was wondering if there is any type of thermal clock or thermal constraint once the MDS is lifted out of the uh, shuttle um, payload bay. I think the biggest concerns on the, on the thermal side are really making sure that we have thermal equilibrium between the MDS and the MT before we perform the, uh, the, the mating operations. I think generally we're in a fairly uh, relatively benign environment there. There probably are some, but I don't think that we're really pushing up against them uh, as long as we're within the, the nominal timeline. And I'll defer to any of my other colleagues here if they have more to add to that. Yeah, uh, the thermal analysis have shown that uh, once you've applied keep alive power to the uh, to the MBS, that all the ORUs are going to be uh, are going to be fine. Uh, the part that we concern uh, we're concerned about is the um, the MT capture latch. There's no heaters on on the capture <laughs> latch, so. Um, you're looking at two things. One, as Chris said, is you have a, uh, a delta between the MBS and the MT that you need to maintain. And then you also have a, uh, a thermal limit, a lower limit, uh, on the capture latch itself. Um, either all the way in the bay 
or within the, the pre-installed position were thermally benign and, and the catcher latch is going to be fine. So that's why we chose to uh, pull it out of the bay and get it right up, you know, within six feet of the MT at the end of the uh, EBA and that way we're ready to go the next morning. Um, and in between, uh, the analysis have shown uh, somewhere in the ballpark of, of three hours, uh, but it's, you know, it's very soft. Uh, uh, so we're not we're not concerned. Um, once we get keep alive power, we just go ahead and move it on up into the uh, into the pre-installed position. If we have any any problems whatsoever, uh, uh, we'll just leave it down in the bay. And just to follow that real quickly, at what point do you get keep alive power on on the MBS, and how long could you leave it hanging out in pre-installed if you had to? Um, okay, we get we'll grapple at, uh, at the end of EBA two when uh, the arm is released from its operations uh, on the MBS, uh, excuse me, at the end of EBA 1, when they're done uh, installing the, the uh, service modules and debris panels, um, while the crew's cleaning up, they're going to go ahead and maneuver the arm down and, and grapple the MBS. And once they grapple it, the, uh, the ground team will be uh, starting to apply keep alive power to the MBS. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure the, I don't want to quote me on this, I can get a, a, the correct answer for you, but um, we're looking at 68 hours while it's left in the bay um, that it would be fine, all the ORUs would be fine um, even without keep alive power applied to it. Um, I, I hope that answers your question. That, that helps a lot, thanks. Um, and in terms of if you had to leave the MBS up there without installing it on the mobile trans uh, border, would you just leave it hanging at the end of the arm? Is there a stowage point on the outside of the station? And if you did leave it on the end of the arm, would the arm then not be useful until you could install the MBS? Uh, the only thing we really would need to do is, is get the capture latch closed onto the MT. And, and with, with the arm applying keep alive power to the MBS, we're good indefinitely. And to answer your question, yes, we'd have to maintain the, uh, the arm and the grapple uh, configuration. Otherwise, you, uh, you can't leave the MBS without power for uh, any, I don't know, it depends on your attitude, uh, what your beta angle is, but uh, we could not leave the uh, MBS unpowered for an extended period of time. So yes, the arm would be uh, basically stuck to the, to the MBS until we uh, were able to get the EVA uh, crew out and, and reconfigure it to MT power. Let me expand on that just a little bit. We actually have looked at worst case scenarios where we could leave the MBS on the station arm indefinitely. Um, like you said during your question, Bill, uh, we could, could leave the, the, the MBS on the arm. We could keep it powered through the arm without it being latched down on the MT. We've looked at loads. We can handle a shuttle undocking and another docking. So. Theoretically, you could stay in that, configure, that configuration indefinitely. Obviously, until you put this thing down, you can't use the station arm for anything else because you used up the, uh, the end effector. Uh, and then like Rick said, we could latch it down. That will also support a shuttle undocking, although we'll need to either get it unlatched or get the bolts driven before we can support the next docking. Mm -hmm. We've looked at that step by step all the way through the EVA like I was talking about earlier as well as through all the, all the uh, robotics. And from a keep alive power perspective, uh, we can keep the, the NDS alive in virtually any configuration, and we can handle just about all the, the full spectrum of load environments, uh, regardless of where we have the NDS, whether it's on the MT or on the R. This is Jim Banky at Space.com. Uh, a couple of quick ones for Chris. I'm still in search of answers to if and when is the step off uh, onto the new mobile base system, and when that wrist roll joint becomes a shoulder roll joint, is that does that make, in effect, that joint more critical to future operations so that you want to get that joint replaced all the more? Uh, I'm not 100% sure when the step-off actually occurs. I don't believe it happens during the dog phase of the mission. Um, I'm sure that can be confirmed by, by my colleagues. I'm fairly certain it will happen sometime during the stage, but not during the dog, uh, not during the dog uh, part of the mission. Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the second part of your question? Well, again, when the wrist roll joint now becomes the shoulder roll joint when it, when it steps off onto the mobile base system, does that joint become more critical? Is the shoulder joint in general more critical to arm operations than, than say, if it was a wrist roll joint? I don't, um, I don't think it becomes more critical. Frankly, I think uh, because of some of the fine alignment that the wrist uh, capabilities give us, 
that having the, any of the problematic joints be bent on the shoulder, we might be in a better position, or probably in a better position to handle uh, any uh, subsequent problems. Hopefully there won't be any. Uh, so no, I, I don't think it becomes, if the problematic joint is in the shoulder, I don't think it's uh, more of a problem. I think it becomes a bit less of a problem in terms of finding the appropriate trajectory to get us to where we need to go. I'll expand on that just a little bit. Um, once the shuttle undocks, uh, we are going to do a full uh, complement of, of checkout for the, uh, the MBS in its new, new home, new configuration. Uh, and it isn't until we've completed all those checkouts and, and that we're comfortable that, that it's a good platform that uh, we're going to walk off the arm uh, from the lab PDGF. Um, I don't have an exact date, uh, but it is during the, during the increment. It's one of our requirements to do before the, uh, the next, the 9A mission where we're going to install the first uh, outboard truss segment. Um, and then as far as um, if it becomes more or less difficult once it becomes uh, that, that shoulder joint, uh, it's functionality, it's the same, same thing. We're going to need the crew to actually, EVA crew to, if we had a failure, we'd need the EVA crew to do a, a drive of the joint. And the only challenge part is it becomes uh, a little bit more difficult because you're, you're, you're actually moving the whole arm um, from down here, and so you got to worry about the trajectories with the elbow and the other joints on the on the arm. Whereas if it's at the other end, it's, it's a real fine-tuned uh, fine-tuned drive. So so it does make things a little more complicated, but it doesn't make it uh, impossible. Okay, thanks, and, and perhaps just a real couple of quick ones here for Paul. I think um, first of all, uh, bait angle cutout going into June. How many days do you got before you have that issue to deal with? Well, you know, I don't remember offhand. I want to say we had about three weeks, though. Mm -hmm. that, it's, it's pretty much the whole month. We, we are starting up. I mean, we are launching into the beginning of, yeah. of the, essentially the open window as a yeah. function of the solar data angle. So it only gets better from the launch date on. And I'm pretty sure we have about a three, three-week data window. Yeah. My last one. Um, I realize this is maybe better asked for a KFC facilities guy, but in terms of your insight into the shuttle program, since the last launch and the scrub for the vent line that, that cracked open, has the shuttle program gone back and looked at the, those vent lines, instrumented the, the lines, done any testing, analysis, anything like that that uh, gives you more or less confidence you won't have the same problem this time around? Well, I can't tell you, I can't tell you everything they've done out there. I can tell you that as recently as last week, uh, they did have techs on the pad and on those lines on the ground. Uh, making sure that we had good instrumentation and we weren't going to be worrying about valve leaks or anything else. And I suspect that John Ira can get you information on everything else KSC has been doing. This is Ocean Earth News again. Okay, I think I understand what the thermal issues are with the MBS. But what happens if you're using the SSR mess, you lift it up uh, out of the bay, you get it close to, to, to the um, thermally benign position next to the MT, and you have a problem with. Uh, the roll joint on the wrist. Do you have enough time to get out uh, Franklin or Philippe with um, with the power ratchet tools and the manual drive uh, to do the rest of the way, or um, are you not going to use that joint, or are you in a bad day situation? Um, okay, let me sure I understand. Once we get it into the pre-installed position and we have a wrist joint failure, is that what your question is? When we're in the pre-installed position? The cargo bay and the uh, MT. Let me run you through the scenario that we've worked through. Um, <clears throat> we've developed our, our plans, our EVA plans, such that uh, pretty much any time during the EVA, if we have a have a risk uh, a failure that defaults us to the utilizing the primary string and the, and the failed wrist roll joint, um, we have uh, trajectories and, and times during the, throughout the EVA that we would uh, have the crew perform a, a direct drive. Uh, the two places are one, right after you lift it out of the bay, well, let me back up. If it failed before you grappled the MBS, you'd have to do a, you'd have to do a drive to get it into the grapple position. Um, if it failed after you grappled it, but before you pulled it out of the bay, they'd lift it right up out of the bay, then they'd do the drive to flip it around and get it in the pre-installed position. And then when they get it up in the pre-installed position, they might have to do a fine tune, but it won't be a, 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 won't be, uh, a major uh, configuration change. Um, and we've worked through all the scenarios such that when it occurred, we'd either defer that activity till the very beginning of the second EVA or uh, at the end of the uh, first EVA. So uh, pretty much we're covered. We know what we'd have to do. Um, and once you get it within six feet, uh, thermally it's very benign. You can stay there uh, until the next day and, and, or the next time we do the EVA. So we'll be in a good configuration. Hope that answers your question. 
Um, only the vague part of if you're stuck somewhere in between, bet uh, between after you remove it from the shuttle cargo bay and before you yeah. install. Pretty much once you get it out of the cargo bay, they do one drive and it's right above the bay, and then you're in a good configuration to get it into the pre-installed position. So uh, there won't be other uh, any other drives uh, other than maybe fine alignment ones when you get up to pre-install. So um, if it failed, um, after you grappled the MBS, uh, they would do the need to do the drive at the very end of the EVA to, to flip it around uh, in its pre-installed configuration, or we would, like I said, would leave it down in the bay in a thermally benign environment for the capture latch, and then defer that uh, activity till the very beginning of the next EVA, and it would be fine um, until then the crew would get out. The very first activity of the, of the EVA would be to tr drive it around, and then they'd move the arm up and install it. So. We're going to be in a good configuration either way. And I'm a little bit surprised. I guess this is either the second or third time you've installed a PD, PDGF um, a grapple fixture on an existing component in space. And the obvious question is why didn't the P6 have this uh, PDGF installed when it was uh, first built, either as the, the, the standard grapple fixture, which uh, the RMS used to raise it, or an additional one on there? It seems like you're always doing these. Uh, additional mod scarring stuff afterwards so where it would have been made more sense to, to launch it in place. Well look when uh, when this when this truss segment was was first designed in a free configuration we're not going to tempor temporarily install P6 on a Z1 sticking out of the top of node one. So I mean it first goes all the way back to the transition from the freedom to the ISS configuration. And I think we will probably stumble across other things like this as we go through the build. And we've known about this one for a while. And the decision was made once it, once it was decided we needed this PDGF to give us the right geometry to ro relocate P6, uh, it was decided late enough that, uh, or it was determined late enough that it was going to cost a lot of money, potentially a processing slip of P6 for us to get that, P6, that PDGF installed on the ground. So at the time it was decided it was more cost effective in the long run uh, for the program to fly that PDGF when we had the chance and get it installed sometime before 13A1. Um, I think for the most part, I mean, I would say 99% or more of those configuration changes that, that we, should have, we should have caught as a function of changing the configuration that we have. Every now and then we're going to find one of these. But I would, I would speculate that all of these we know about a year or two years or more in advance of flying that hardware. And the tough decision then becomes, do we spend the money? Do we potentially take the processing and the launch slip to fix that hardware on the ground? Or is it easy enough for us to resolve when the hardware is in orbit? And we're going to be faced with those questions for the next couple of years while we finish the build. And uh, I forgot it was Paul or Rick who mentioned the reboots that you got two planned and the uh, third one that if you needed it, what's the issue there if you hit uh, the ceiling of uh, uh, the, the desirable um, uh, ISS altitude or phasing angles for the next uh, uh, visiting spacecraft? Yeah, our constraint really will be phasing angles for uh, the next progress. It won't be altitude. I don't expect we have enough delta V to take station too high. Uh, we do have three full one hour periods scheduled for the reboots. And we'll be talking over the next week and a half, right up to the first reboot, uh, to make sure we understand exactly what we want the plan to be. And we really have two different options we can go with. And we're just waiting for the trajectory folks uh, to fine tune their analysis and determine where they really want station to be in space. So from our perspective, it's not really any impact. We have the time scheduled. We have the gas. Uh, we just need to decide how much delta V we need to give station. Um, Todd Halverson, New York Times, with the last question from KSC for Michael Rodriguez. I was wondering, Michael, if you had uh, figures in pounds for how much food, water, water, clothing, scientific gear, equipment are going up to station, and like or similar figures for what is coming down, or perhaps even a generic down mass weight. I know that uh, before I, I came in here, I had a chance to take a look at the uh, UF-1 pre-flight briefing in which Susan Voss uh, did go over specifically uh, poundage of each of the individual items. Um, I wasn't expecting to go into that level of detail with this briefing. Um, it's fairly typical for this mission uh, for the NPLM as far as quantity up and down. Uh, the overall weight of the NPLM for launch is roughly about 23,000 pounds, and the return is roughly about 20,000 pounds. 
Um, I do know for the uh, up uh, cargo, it's on the order of about two and a quarter tons of actual cargo inside the MPLM, and, and I apologize, I don't have specific numbers for each of the individual items, but we certainly have that data and I can give it to you. I just don't have it off the top of my head. Sorry. And I believe that was the last question from Kennedy Space Center. We'll come back to Johnson Space Center for any follow-ups here. And Mark? Uh, Mark Kerr, Houston Chronicle. I had a trivia question on the uh, debris shields. You mentioned a mass of 109 pounds. Was that for the whole set or per? Uh, let's see. I believe that the 109 pounds was just for the shields themselves. Uh, the structure, the, uh, the equipment that is housing the shields um, is around 290 pounds or so. So the whole conglomerate is roughly in the order of, of 400 pounds. Okay, I guess I was just wondering if each shield weighed 109 pounds or that was no, the weight no, for the whole set. the whole set. So it's a very lightweight yes, material. Yes, it is. Thank you. And Marcia? Marcia Dunn, Associated Press, probably for Rick. Um, could you quickly go through who replaces who um, in the expedition teams and is this going to be in a compressed period of time or is this going to drag on uh, for a good part of the day? Um, well, as far as the exchange, uh, the two commanders, Yuri Anafranco, will be replaced with uh, Valeri Korzun. And then uh, the flight engineer one on the expedition four is Carl Waltz, and he will be replaced with Peggy, Peggy Whitson on the expedition five. And then finally, we have um, FE2 on the expedition four is Dan Bursch, who will be replaced with the expedition five, uh, Sergei um, Trisha. I guess I was looking for the order. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Um, actually, on flight day three, we're going to do. Uh, this is relatively new change. We're going to try and we're going to do all three seat liners, the IELKs we call them, the Soyuz uh, seat liners for their uh, return in the Soyuz. We'll do those on flight day three, and they're going to do them all at the same time. And then um, on flight day four, we're going to do a uh, a SIMO um, pressure suit pressure check for all the Sopal suits. So uh, to answer your question, we're doing them all at the same time on flight day three and flight day four. So the new crew is not official until flight day four? Um, the well, there's mm -hmm. different opinions of when you consider a new crew. Um, uh, once you've done the, it's technically it's when you've done the pressure checks of the suits. So yes, ma'am, flight, flight day flight four. Flight day four, the new crew takes charge. And um, how many spacewalks could you cram into this mission if you needed to? And I guess that means you'd have to do back to back since there's no extra days. And, and would, would you consider that if you needed it? We have looked at uh, some of these scenarios, and uh, although we don't like it, if absolutely required, we could look at doing one on flight day 10. Uh, this is if we run into problems with the uh, joint replacement, um, and it would have to be done in, you know, simultaneous with uh, putting the NPLM back into the bay. Um, Paul, what are the scenarios that we looked at? Um, you know, we could insert probably one more EVA in between any of these EVAs. I would expect that the most you would see us even attempt on this flight would be four, and I don't, I don't expect us to go down that path unless our backs were really up against the wall and we needed an EVA to save hardware. Um, the flight plan is already very full. We already have a relatively full EVA load. Uh, as Rick said, we could do something as sporty as trying an EVA in parallel with pulling the MPLM off station and put, putting it back in the bay. If you just do the math, we have enough crew members to spread out and do all of that work at the same time. But that's a lot of balls in the air for us to be juggling at one time. And we would really only attempt that if we were going to lose some major piece of hardware without it. Otherwise, we would be deferring that EVA off to the stage. Any additional questions here at Johnson Space Center? I understand we do have a couple of questions from headquarters. Uh, are you been taking uh, any new additional uh, security measures given the uh, recent warnings and remarks by uh, this President Cheney yesterday uh, concerning a terrorism threat? And, and, yeah. I think the question had to do with um, our response to concerns with terrorism and so forth. Uh, I, I can't respond to that, to be quite honest with you. I'm not sure any of us can. Uh, that I wouldn't be better for, for the previous briefing. Uh, John, if you maybe can take a stab at trying well, to Well, yeah, certainly we, uh, we intend to take all appropriate security measures, and uh, we just can't discuss what those measures might be. Uh, Bill Hart with CBS again with a real quick one. Uh, I think Bill Hurst from our 
said in the first briefing that the debris shields on service module increased its ability to withstand impacts by something like 1%. Can you put that in terms that I can understand? Does that give you a greater size uh, particle that it would protect against or whatever? I'm not sure I understand what the 1% um, what that references. That means we have 1% probability, less probability of, of taking a debris hit that would penetrate the hull. And it really is that simple. Um, there's been some statistical analysis that was done over the lifetime of the vehicle. Um, and that statistical analysis based on some statistical representation of debris that's in orbit um, indicates that we have, and I don't remember what the number is right now, to tell you the truth, uh, but it gives us some fixed percentage probability over a 10-year period of having a debris strike that would penetrate the hull if we didn't move out of the way for it. Um, and by adding these shields, we improve that by 1%. And I believe that was the last question from headquarters. Any final questions here at Johnson Space Center? Seeing none, we'll conclude this briefing. Well, good day and welcome back to the Johnson Space Center as the STS-111 and Expedition 5 pre-flight briefings continue. This is the briefing to focus in on the three spacewalks that will be conducted during the course of STS-111. And with us today to discuss those spacewalks is the lead EVA officer for STS-111, Trisha Mack. Trisha? Good morning, Rob. The crew and the flight team are very excited about our upcoming three spacewalks on UF-2. They've trained extensively. We've trained about 130 hours in the neutral buoyancy lab, and I think the crew is plenty sick of the mock-ups and they're ready to trade in the pool mock-ups for some flight hardware on orbit. Our EVAs will mark the 14th, 15th, and 16th space station-based EVAs, and for those who are counting, it will be the 39th, 40th, and 41st station assembly and maintenance EVAs. We have two main objectives. I'm sure you heard a lot about them this morning and a few secondary objectives of our three spacewalks. The first is to prepare the mobile remote service or base system or the MBS to be the new base for the space station arm. The MBS will, after UF2, be the new home. Like I said, the station arm will walk off onto the MBS the MBS is on the mobile transporter, and this gives it the capability to move the station arm up and down the truss of the space station, bringing Canada Arm 2 wherever it is needed to continue our build of space station. So it's quite a critical element. The second main objective that we've heard a lot talked about is the space station wrist roll joint remove and replace. This will occur on EVA3, and I'll provide some details with that later. I'd like to start by reviewing what each crew member will be doing to prepare for the spacewalks. Our EV-1, our extravehicular crew member number one, is Franklin Chain Diaz, and it's Franklin's seventh space flight, and everyone's always amazed that it's his seventh flight. He's tying the record with Jerry Ross, which was set on 8A on the last mission for American trips to space, but it is his first time that he's going to be doing an EVA, so he'll be adding this feather to his cap, and we'll be letting him outside. In order to distinguish between him and Philippe Perrin, our EV2, um, Franklin will be wearing red stripes on his legs and on his backpack. Philippe will be in the all-white spacesuit. He's representing Kness, the French space agency. He will also have a French flag on his upper arm. So in case you can't see his backpack or his legs, you'll see the flag and know it's Philippe. Franklin and Philippe will perform all three spacewalks. They occur on flight days five, seven, and nine, so we have our day off in between. And while they're rookies now, they're certainly going to be veteran spacewalkers when this whole mission is over. We can't forget about our IV, our intravehicular crew member. His name is Paul Lockhart. He's the pilot, but more important to us, he's a choreographer of our spacewalks. You can kind of think of him as the conductor. He is preparing Franklin and Philippe before the spacewalks, getting them in their suits. He's also the one who's keeping them on track during the EVAs. So you're going to hear his voice a lot directing, and even though you won't see him, he plays a vital role to the success of our EVAs. We have a backup crew member, Peggy Whitson, who's newly arriving on Space Station. She's an Increment 5 crew member, and she will back up Philippe or Franklin in the off chance that one of them wouldn't be able to perform the spacewalks. So she's ready and willing, though, of course, we wouldn't wish that. We have to use her capability. Other people who will be helping out, Valeri Korzun is the Increment 5 commander, and he will be flying the space station arm. 
and on EVA-1, that is. On EVAs-1 and 3, Ken Cockrell, who is the Space Shuttle Commander, will be operating the Space Shuttle arm. So it's quite a team of people. We also have Carl and Dan, since they have so much experience on the space station and with EVA, they're going to be also helping out our um, space walkers prior to the EVAs and with some tool configs. So it's quite a team of people to prepare for our three spacewalks. Everyone's always curious about our EMU plan, our spacesuit plan, so I'll just start off with it. We're launching only two suits. They're both sized large on the orbiter. Franklin will be using one of the larges, so we'll move the suit over to the space station and he'll use that. When he's done using that, it's going to stay, so it's making a one-way trip, and that will become the large spacesuit for Commander Valeri Corzun in the future. Franklin, or excuse me, Pepe, and I should have started. I knew this was going to happen. Philippe is also known as Pepe, and you're going to hear that a lot and during the flight. Our Paul Lockhart, our IV, is also known as Paco, and Ken Cockrell is the commander, and he's Taco. So we have a Paco, a Pepe, and a Taco. It gets a little confusing, but that's, I'm sure I'm going to lapse into calling them that. So um, as I was saying, Philippe is wearing an extra large suit. That suit is currently on orbit right now. This was the spacesuit for Yuri Anafranco. And we also um, saw it last used on Flight 8A. Steve Smith wore it. And we'll return that spacesuit at the end of our mission. The large that is launched on UF-2 is left for Expedition 5 crew member Sergei Treshev. And it has no intention to be used, but it's um, replacing the suit as part of our rotation plan. So the nuts and bolts, at the end of our transfers, we will have three spacesuits on orbit, three EMUs that is, two larges, and one medium. And while there are no planned uses for those spacesuits during this stage, we will have them on orbit in case they need to go out. To give you a brief overview of the highlights of um, the flight day by flight day through, as seen through the eyes of EVA, flight day two will check out the two suits that we bring up. Flight day three will gather our tools and the hardware we need and get them prepared to transfer to the space station. And after we dock, we'll transfer those. Flight day four is when we configure all of our tools. And we also have an all crew procedure review that is led by Paco. So prior to every EVA, the IV crew member gathers everyone together and reviews the upcoming EVA's uh, timeline. On flight day five, expedition crew member Dan Birch will help out Paco getting the guys suited up and doing their pre-brief, and flight day five is our EVA-1. As I said earlier, the EVAs are on flight days five, seven, and nine. Peggy will also be helping out on flight day five, kind of learning the ropes from Dan, and on flight day seven, she'll be the one helping out Paco before the EVA. After flight day nine, we're done essentially with our work. On flight day 10, we'll pack up the tools that we brought over. And on flight day 11, we'll transfer the spacesuits to make sure that we get the right sizes on the right side of the hatch. One change that has happened since, since 8A that is a little bit different, we will be using primarily shuttle oxygen during our pre-breathe. Usually we use the oxygen and the high pressure gas tanks outside of Quest but the compressor that's used to transfer the oxygen from the space station to the space shuttle has recently had its life lowered. And in order to reduce the cycles on that compressor, we have come up with a new plan, and that is to use oxygen from the shuttle for about 80% of our pre-breathe. This does not change the protocol. It's just a different way of getting oxygen. It's just a different source. With that, I'll go into the details of our three spacewalks. EVA-1 is scheduled to last six hours. This is our shortest scheduled EVA of the flight. There are three main objectives. The first, the crew will remove a power and data grapple fixture from the sidewall of the orbiter in port bay 13 and installed on the P6 truss. This is used to move the P6 truss later in the 13A.1 stage to the outboard of station. Second, the crew will remove six Russian-built service module debris panels. I'll probably just call them shields from here on out and we'll temp stow them on PMA-1 in an adapter on a foot restraint. These shields um, are then going to be installed by Peggy Whitson and Valeria Corzun in the increment onto the service module, which is their final home. Finally, the crew will remove thermal blankets covering seven critical components of the MBS, and that ends our EVA-1. Franklin is on the station arm for the first two tasks, and Philippe will be a free floater. Like I mentioned earlier, Valeri is driving the station arm. 
and the shuttle arm is not used by Franklin and Philippe, but it will be used in this EVA to help monitor clearances between structure and Ken Cockrell, who will be very busy. He'll be flying the shuttle arm on this EVA. With that, I'd like to show the video. First, I'm going to give an overview of payload bay, as the crew members would see it, and flight day five. The MPLM is already installed. On the right, flashing soon, is the MBS in bays three and four. The next you'll see is the joint. This is our replacement joint flown up a little bit aft on its sidewall carrier. On the right of it is a temporary stowage spot we make use of during the EVA. At that back end of the payload bay is the power data grapple fixture. It's held on by four bolts. On the other side, in the bay 13, are the six service module debris panels that are flown as a stack. Here you see the station arm ready and waiting for Franklin as he egresses. He'll hop onto that as they egress quest, and he will immediately go to the PDGF to remove it. Franklin, excuse me, Pepe, who's not shown in this picture, is installing an adapter on a foot restraint to prepare to stow the shield later. Here you see the PDGF magically hop into Franklin's hands. Sometimes we wish it were that easy. And then Valeri will drive Franklin up to P6. The adapter ring is already flown in place that this will mate to, and it's on the port forward edge of P6. Franklin, or excuse me, Philippe is busy translating all through this EVA. He will have met Franklin up at the work site. You see the grapple fixture uh, flashing. On the left is Philippe in his foot restraint that the 8A crew was kind enough to leave for us. Franklin, again, is based on the arm. Here's some footage of our training in the neutral buoyancy lab. Franklin was a real trooper going heads down to remove this grapple fixture. Here you see Philippe on the left in a foot restraint and Franklin on the right. There are four bolts that hold the grapple fixture to the truss and they torque down these bolts using their um, power tools. So you see Franklin configuring his and starting to put the tool on the bolt head. You can also see the red stripes in this picture. Even for training, we have them wear the red stripes. Next is the shield install. So Philippe will translate all the way down to the bay to help Franklin. Franklin will release bolts holding down the three rods you see here. And then he opens the rods up, holds onto the shield and he takes the shields up to the PMA. Philippe is down helping with this operation. He's not shown in this picture. He also folds the TDK. They actually fold up against that um, shield, excuse me, up against the sidewall. Valeri drives them up for his last motion for the EVA crew members onto PMA-1. And you see the adapter will flash in a moment. This adapter is kind of unique. The top part was built by the Russians, and the bottom part was built by the U.S to fit into an APFR, a foot restraint. The crew members put the shields into the foot restraint and then tether it down. Here you see the three rods I was talking about. These stay with the sidewall and return to earth. They're only used to hold the six shields in place. And these shields you see here are very high fidelity, so they look almost identical to the flight shields. And that probe you see sticking out the middle, that's the magnetic probe that is going to go, excuse me, it's a probe that goes into magnetic socket. And here you see that installed on PMA-1, the crane's in the background, and then the crew tethers it. At this point, we're done using the arm for EVA, and we're going to hand over controls inside from Valeri to Peggy and Carl, who will grapple the MBS in the payload bay. They'll apply Keep Alive. Once Keep Alive power has been confirmed, then the crew members will translate down, and they will remove seven blankets from critical components. Right now you see one of the two MBS computer units flashing. There's the second one. Then there are two video distribution units that they'll remove. Here's the first one, and then to the right is the second. There's a camera in the, at the keel that you can't see. They also remove a blanket from that. And then the CRPCM, Canadian Remote Power Control Module, kind of a switching unit. And here's the POA that they spoke about earlier, the end effector. We're only taking a blanket off of a camera there. This is what you see. This is what the crew members saw in the neutral buoyancy lab so many times. They together take off the majority of the blankets. There's a protective radiative finish on all of these um, 
components that we don't want to mar, so they're very careful about taking it off. At this point, it's the end of EVA-1, and Carl and Peggy will take the MBS out of the payload bay and move it to the pre-install location above the mobile transporter. The crew members will be cleaning up and making their way back to Quest as this happens. And that ends our EVA-1. After EVA-1, we'll be obviously doing getting the crew out of the suits. After EVA-1, we recharge the batteries. We use a lot of different batteries, power, ba power tool batteries, um, the EMU batteries, helmet light batteries. All of these get recharged only after EVA-1 because the increment crew has already charged the remaining ones that we need. EVA-2 is scheduled to last six and a half hours, and the purpose of EVA-2 is to prepare the MBS as a new platform for the space station arm. The EVA crew does this in a manner of different ways. The first thing that they'll do is hook up power, data, and video cables between the MBS and the mobile transporter. Then we'll rotate the POA, or the payload or U accommodation. That's basically the same thing as an end effector, and it's actually a spare end effector for the space station arm. It obviously also has its own use, and that's to translate payloads up and down the truss of station, but it could be used as a spare to the end effector on the arm. Then they'll drive four bolts that structurally attach the MBS to the mobile transporter, and they'll move a camera on the MBS. It originally was flown in the keel location, and that was to aid in installation of the MBS onto the mobile transporter. After it's installed, it doesn't need to be there anymore, and so we move it to the top of the mast and that is where it's needed for 9A, for the installation of S1 onto S0. The last task is to stow a bag that has a contingency cable in it. You can kind of think of this contingency cable as an extension cord. The mobile transporter stops along the truss at different electrical ports and plugs in. If the mobile transporter, for some reason, were to get stuck in between ports, then the crew members would be able to do an EVA retrieve this cable and it plug it in into an extension cable and then reel out the rope, all the, excuse me, the cable all the way up to the MBS. So that's just a contingency. We don't plan on needing it for our EVA, but it'll be stowed out there. Franklin and Philippe will both free float during EVA 2 and their work site will be on the MBS. So if we can show the video, please. This is what the space station will look like at the beginning of EVA-2, the arm, the MBS will have already been um, installed on the mobile transporter at the beginning of flight day six. So right now there's just a claw holding the MBS to the MT. The station arm is still providing power to it. The first thing we want to do is remedy that and get power routed to the MBS through those electrical ports I was talking about. The first thing the crew will do is to install a redundant um, excuse me, a prime video and data cable that they bring out with them. You see it's flashing right now between the MBS and the MT. Then they will install a redundant video and data cable between the MBS and the MT. And you see the white boxes there with the handrails. Those are the active halves of the power, um, the power boxes I was talking about. And so to hook those up, the crew removes a jumper that flew on the MBS and then they take the power cable that was already there launched on 8A and connect that power box to the MBS. So there's your prime. And then the crew will take the second jumper off and connect the redundant power. At this point, the ground controllers will be able to power up the MBS using power from station through the um, UMA, the Universal Mating Adapter Assembly and we'll get a check out of the MBS not on station power. Here you see Philippe on the left in the MBL and you see um, Franklin on the right. It's quite an interesting work site. There's a lot of cables, connector caps, tethers that they have to be careful of. You also see the ORUs, the critical components that they removed the blankets from earlier that they're not supposed to be touching. So they're very careful in this work site and obviously we want to hook up our cables correctly. The next task is to rotate the POA, or the end effector, off of the mast. You see it flashing. It's held onto that mast by one bolt. Philippe will release the one bolt, and he starts rotating it out. Franklin will then pick up the rest of the rotation and finish it, and then the POA is held down to its support structure by two bolts. 
Normally, Philippe is based in a foot restraint, but he can be free float as you see here. He's at the top of the picture, and Franklin's at the bottom in case it was too difficult or if we had a problem rotating it. He can definitely give a little assistance. The next task is to install, is to torque down the four bolts. The bolts flow, flew on the MBS installed, so they're in a launch lock position. The crew members will drive the four bolts into the MT, and this is what's structurally attaching the MBS to the mobile transporter. After this, you'll hear them give a go, and the folks on the ground will release the claw that was previously the only attachment between the MBS and the mobile transporter. It's kind of a difficult um, area to reach. So we have a special tool that we're borrowing from Hubble Space Telescope folks, and that's an extendable um, extension for the power tool. In the right of the picture, you see Franklin, and he's using that 18 to 24 inch adjustable extension to access one of his bolts. And Philippe's a little bit hidden, but he's in the top left, and he's able on that bolt to attack it from the side with um, just a short extension. The next task after we do the bolts, on 8A we had a failure or a potential unknown failure of the um, cutter for the cable that provides power and video and data to the mobile transporter. You see it flashing here. Actually, the Nader one is the one that had the problem, but we're concerned enough about the Zenith one that we're going to re-safe a bolt that would prevent the cable from being cut. So it's just one bolt. We're going to turn it seven times, and that'll be the end of that task. Franklin's right there. Here's the camera flashing. This is in the keel location, as I mentioned earlier, and then it gets moved up to the top of the mast. It's held on just by one bolt, and Franklin's going to release it from the keel location, and he hands it off to Philippe, kind of like passing the torch. So you see Franklin at the top of the picture, and he passes it off to Philippe, who grabs hold of it, and he's in a foot restraint. And at the bottom of the picture, you kind of see a white shoe-looking thing, and he's going to install the camera into that location, torque it down with one bolt, and then give the go to power up the camera and make sure that it works in this location. This camera is identical to the two that are on the space station arm, so between the three of them, you could act as spares to each other. Here's the contingency cable bag that you see flashing. It's just a bag with four integrated tethers. The crew members will take it out with them. They'll bring it in Quest and depress with it. They'll bring it out to the work site and install it between handrails and some tether points. And again, if we needed this on future EVAs, crew members could go get the cable, plug into one of those electrical ports, and then string up the cable to the MBS to provide Keep Alive power. And this concludes EVA 2. At the end of EVA 2, we will not charge batteries, as I mentioned earlier, but we will do some Medox regeneration. EVA 3 is our longest EVA. It is scheduled to last seven hours. The sole purpose of EVA 3 is to replace the Canon Arm 2's wrist roll joint. The joint has suffered a short in its brake bus circuitry, and so it's down one of its strings. By replacing the joint, we will regain the redundancy in this joint. To clarify which joint we'll be changing out, here's the model of the station arm. I realize it's kind of small. We'll be working on the free end of the arm. So the fixed end is going to remain fixed on destiny, and the free end is what we'll be working on. The way to go over the anatomy of the arm, we have the boom, then you have your pitch, your yaw, your roll joint, and then the end effector. In order to get to the roll joint, the easiest method we have is to actually remove the end effector, take it off and temp stow it, then we're going to remove the joint, we'll replace the joint with a new one, and then we'll go retrieve the end effector and reattach it to the joint. It seems um, a little interesting, we have to take it apart, but this really was the easiest method to do this joint change out and still accomplish all of our tasks in one EVA. To give you some background, the robotic arm was fortunately designed exactly with EVA in mind. Each of the components of the arm, the boom, the joints, and the end effectors are held together to the next component, to its neighboring component, with six special bolts called expandable diameter fasteners. 
This is really the key to this whole EVA. You're going to hear expandable bolts and expandable diameter fasteners many times. An, expander, an expandable diameter fastener has expanding collets on it so that when the crew drives the bolt, the collets actually expand against the bushing it's inserted in, and that's what's holding it. I have an example of an EDF here. So the crew members are going to insert these. They're already on the joint. They fly captive, so this part's up against the joint. The crew member will insert the EDF and then we'll torque it down. And you can see the collets here. This is what will expand. Each joint has a clevis interface and a lug interface. So the two come together, and so you have three pieces of metal, and then the crew inserts the EDF through them. Within that inner clevis, there's a male hex head, and at the end of the EDF, you see the female interface. So when they insert it all the way through, they'll rotate it until it fits on the hex head, and then they will actually start torquing it. It's a 7 16 inch um, he uh, head, which is our nominal EVA tool size, and then the crew will drive them in. So between each end effector and joint, and between each joint, um, there are six of these. And then there's also one electrical mate, D mate connector, and that controls four hidden connectors within the joint or within the lee. So in order to take the end effector off, uh, Philippe will be on the end of the arm and he will remove one, he'll untorque one bolt that drives the four connectors that you won't be able to see until you take off the joint. And then together, Franklin and Philippe will each remove three or release three of the EDS. And that way the joint can come off. We have um, fantastic Canadian counterparts at McDonald Detweiler Robotics in Brampton, Ontario. And um, they happen, it sounds like they have all these cool spare parts, but they happen to have a yaw joint, which is almost identical to the roll joint that we're switching out. It's a little bit longer, but the interfaces are identical. And they have spare end effector. It was flight equipment that they arranged for our demonstration. So the crew flew up and we were able to practice removing and replacing a yaw joint onto the end effector. So the beginning of the video that I'm about to show will give you a little more idea of exactly what the flight interfaces look like and it will also give you an appreciation for the size um, of hardware that the crew is going to be handling. The one thing in the video to note, there's no of none of the white covering, the protective um, thermal covering. So it's going to look a little different than the joints you're used to seeing on, on orbit. And just for your information, the Lee weighs about 450 pounds and the joint weighs about 220 pounds. So they're, they're not small things that we're going to be maneuvering around. With that, can I please have the video? Here in Brampton, you see there's your EDF, expendable diameter fastener, and this is the clevis side. We don't see a lug, so that he inserted it. And within that top cap is the hex head that the bolt rests on. Here you see the six EDFs around the perimeter. You see four electrical connectors. That's the ones that you can't see until you take it apart, obviously. The person is holding right now something we call a scoop. And it was named literally after an ice cream scooper because of its similarity. And it's a generic handling device. And that's what the crew is going to be using to hold on to the end effector as well as the joint. They also won't be putting their hand right in the interface, but for 1G, we need a little assistance. So on the left, you see the clevis interface. And on the right, the lug. They come together. And then the crew will insert the six EDFs. We use our power tool, and you see Franklin on the right in the lovely green hard hat. He has the power tool, and he's configuring it, and he's about to torque one of his of the one of the three EDFs that he'll be torquing. The end effector is what you see in the beginning of the picture, and then the yaw joint is in the rear of the picture. So you can kind of get an appreciation for how large they are. Here's Philippe holding the power tool, and we're simulating him doing one of his EDFs. Before we go out EVA on uh, flight day nine, the station arm will have already been configured like this. We're going to be using the forward nadir part of Destiny as our work site, and so everything will be ready for us. The shuttle arm's on the left of the picture, and Philippe is going to be working from that. Franklin's working from a lab-based foot restraint. You see him just popped into the picture. And Franklin, excuse me, Pepe, like I said earlier, will be on the shuttle arm. 
the first thing they're going to do, since we're taking the end effector off and we want to preserve the camera that's on there, it won't be powered, we're going to attach um, a thermal blanket over the camera. That was just shown flashing. And then the crew will rotate the lead and then we'll give the call to power the arm off because obviously we want it powered off before we remove the components. Once it's powered off, Frank, or Philippe will release the electrical mate demate connector and then Franklin and Philippe will each release their three EDS. They'll remove the end effector and we have a nifty way of temp stowing it on the side of destiny in a foot restraint. So there's a scoop on the end effector. Then we attach something called a ball stack, which is a rigid tether, and that rigid tether then goes into the foot restraint. So we're temp stowing the end effector on a foot restraint. Here's some footage in the neutral buoyancy lab. You have Franklin working on his back primarily off of a foot restraint, and Philippe's in the top of the picture on the arm, and you can see the fine guidance that you need to make sure these interfaces line up. Philippe's holding it onto it using the handrail in one scoop. The next is to take the actual failed joint off, and it goes down into the payload bay on the sidewall carrier on a temp stow spot. I'm going to start sounding like a broken record, but one mate demate, six EDF to attach it. Then they'll remove on the, the new joint. There's a thermal blanket they'll take off. They'll bring it up to the lab. Franklin translates back up. They install it onto the exposed yaw joint. The next thing in here, again, you see um, we're mostly, we're going to be doing most EVA right here on the forward part of Destiny. And you see Franklin helping Pepe take off the joint. Interestingly enough, the joint is temp stowed only um, here. You see it in the bottom of the picture. In the pool, we ran Nader up, so that means the forward part of the space shuttle is into the pool. So the joint is only temporarily stowed on this location. It can't come home. We'll have to come back to this work site and move it to the launch location. The launch location has a heater pad underneath it to protect the new joint, as well as a thermal blanket. Here are Franklin and Philippe installing the new joint onto the yaw joint. Again. Six EDFs, one electrical mate, D-mate. The last part of the joint change out is to go to the lab and retrieve that end effector that they had temporarily stowed on the foot restraint. So you see Franklin disappear out of his foot restraint to help. He releases the rigid tether. Philippe holds onto the end effector and together they reinstall it on the end of the new joint. This essentially completes the EVA as far as the joint change out. We'll give the command and the robotics folks on the ground will start powering it up and checking it out. Franklin and Philippe will move the failed joint from its temporary stowage location to it, the launch location where the new joint was, apply heater power if necessary, put the thermal blanket on it because obviously we want to keep this joint as in good condition as we can so they can examine it on the ground. Then. Taco will fly Pepe back to the Destiny where he will egress the foot restraint and the crew will then clean up their work site and hopefully, if time permits, move some foot restraints. At the end of this EVA, it is our third and final EVA, we will we'll have successfully prepared the MBS for the, to be the new home of the space station arm and we also will have replaced full capability of the, uh, the Canada arm too. After this EVA, we'll be doing some uh, Medox regeneration, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of excitement on board after completing three tough EVAs. That's all I have. Thanks, Tricia. We'll take questions here in Houston before going down to the other centers. Marsha? Um, Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Could you give me the dimensions or at least an idea of the size of the wrist joint? Sort of. Yeah, probably about a foot and a half long and a foot in diameter. It's mostly cylindrical. I can get you the exact dimensions later. Oh, that'd be great. Um, and is it clumsy uh, to handle? Um, what, no, because... What are they actually holding on to there? Are there grips or...? Um, again, the Canadians have a superb design. It was made to be changed out. Um, there are things we call micro fixtures on the joint and also on the end effector, and that's what the scoop attaches to. 
so this generic handling device will go on the square micro fixture, and that is what um, Philippe will be holding on to to rotate to move the end effector as well as the joint. So the end effector might be a little clumsy, but he has a handrail and a scoop to use, and the joint, it's small enough, it's about this big, and when you put a scoop on it, it's fine. So their hands never touch it per se, it's always the scoop? Um, we try to avoid touching it because there are sensitive surfaces on the joint, the radiative surfaces that you wouldn't want to mess up. Also, um, within the joint, obviously crew members don't put their fingers, you know, into electrical sockets, but there could be some sharp edges there. So they primarily handle it with the scoop. Okay. Uh, Dave Santucci with CNN. Um, with a third EVA, what's the most challenging aspect of this? I mean, you've had less time for prepare, you've got these small bolts to deal with. What's the most challenging part of the third EVA that the uh, guys have sort of expressed while working in the pool? Um, I think the first challenge was the compressed schedule that we were working on. Um, they've really risen to the challenge and we are definitely ready for this even though we wor did work under a compressed schedule. As far as um, the complexity of the task, I would say um, as long as those EDFs are withdraw easily and as long as the uh, clevis and lug interfaces separate. Those are the two most critical times that we'll be watching. Um, the rest, you almost see you get into a rhythm, it's the same thing, you know, six EDFs, one electrical mate, D-mate. So I would say the EDF insertion and removal as well as the um, actual physically taking the end effector and the joint apart. Mark? Uh, thanks. Mark Corot from the Houston uh, Chronicle. I think you partially answered this question just now when you said the challenge was the, the training schedule. Um, it's probably more difficult than it looks. Can you sort of explain what was involved in coordinating the, the training so they could do this? Is, I guess right. it's not a generic ORU task at all. No, it, it's not. It, it definitely needs flight specific training. Um, March 20th is when we all got the news that we'd have a 30 VA. Up until now, we were a nice two spacewalk flight, and on March 20th, they decided to add the third EVA. Um, from that moment, we all had a big job to do. Um, we needed to, first of all, um, have a different pool config. Our pool config wasn't going to support the training that we had, so we had to modify a mock-up. Um, we actually, we obviously had to get on the crew schedule to add neutral buoyancy lab runs. We had a development team of Scott Parazinski and Jeff Williams who actually did two water runs in the neutral buoyancy lab to help get out the kinks of the preliminary procedures before we showed them to the flight crew. We also went to Canada, as I mentioned earlier, and worked on the um, on flight units of a yaw joint and an end effector. So there were a lot of people who had to come together. We did not have the luxury of time, but um, the team was fantastic and just really pulled it together, and we tried to make it as um, painless for the crew as possible. Vincent Sabatier from Clint. Is there any chance that the space weather will affect one of those uh, EVAs? The space weather? Yes. Due to the recent uh, solar flares. Right. I have not heard about that, and that's not my area of expertise, but so far no one has called to, to warn us about that. Okay. Let's go to NASA headquarters now. We can come back here later for any follow-ups. Yeah. Hi. Bill Hart with CBS. Uh, I'll play devil advocates to Mark Caro's question and say that um, despite the, the compressed schedule, it looks like a pretty straightforward job. I mean, you're, as long as the EDS works, this looks pretty simple. Am I, am I misinterpreting something? Well, uh, we in EVA never like to think of our tasks as simple, but it is a straightforward EVA if all the hardware goes correctly. I guess what's complex about it is the timing. I uh, failed to mention that we will be powering the arm up in between um, after we remove the end effector and the wrist roll joint. When the crew's in the bay working and safely away from the work site, we will power the arm up to protect some of the uh, components on it that would normally be without power. So there's a lot of commanding between the ground, the station crew, and then obviously the EVA crew. Um, and just having been thrown this with, it, with less than two months, I wouldn't say it's simple, but you're right that the, um, as long as the hardware works, it'll be pretty straightforward. Which is a perfect segue to my next question, which is what if the hardware doesn't work? If uh, one of the EDS fails to to come out, for example, or something like that, what are your contingency uh, plans for dealing with that? 
Well, in EVA, we love to think what if. So we have um, a long list of contingencies we've trained for. One, if, if we have a faulty EDF, um, we are flying a spare. So even though I said that they're captive, um, the EDF I showed you had steel lanyards. Our lanyards are Kevlar uh, for the flight unit. So you could cut the Kevlar cords, and we have the spare ready to go, and we could use a new EDF. If, they can, if the um, clevis and lug interface wouldn't come apart, we have a contingency plan. And I hate saying this because I know the Canadians don't like it, but um, we have a pry bar on the space station that we could use to maybe give it a little help coming apart. Um, we've tried to think of everything and uh, train the crew to protect for it. Uh, thanks. That's very helpful. And, and just one more for a guy who yesterday was attaching lights to the outside of his house using some of those expandable concrete toggle bolts that everyone loves so much. I didn't really understand how the EDS work. Um, I'm assuming that uh, they can't get jammed in the expanded position, for example. They must collapse back to some um, uncompressed thing. Could you just talk about that a little bit? Right. That's a very good question. The EDS, we were a bit concerned before we went to Brampton. What if they don't collapse back down? Um, when you tighten them, obviously they expand against the bushing. The total length of the EDF shrinks. So here they've been on orbit, they've been loaded, they've gone through thermal cycles, and we asked the experts in Brampton. And um, basically, when you untorque the EDF, those collets should um, retract back down and withdraw. The, pro the thermal properties of the EDFs are very similar to the thermal bushing that it's in, so they thought about that. We don't think we'll have a problem. And one of the simple workarounds, believe it or not, is just to tap on the end of the EDF after you've untorqued it to hopefully help those collets recede if necessary. So we do have a workaround that if we get in that case, we will try it out. Tracy Watson with USA Today. Which of these tasks would you say requires the most manual dexterity or strength? I know you've had some, um, some, other, some other EVAs in the recent past that, that really required a lot of finesse, and I'm wondering if there's anything comparable on, this, on these EVAs. I would say EVA-3 simply because um, the, there's so many EVFs that we're torquing, and we torque them up to 25 foot-pounds. So that's the most we usually ask an EVA crew member to do. That's the limit of our power tool in the, in the, in the normal mode. So um, because they're torquing so many, um, the position Franklin is in on his back on Destiny, I would say that um, that's probably the most physically challenging task. And how do these EVAs compare to some of the other uh, station assembly EVAs in terms of difficulty and then maybe to some of the pre-station EVAs? Well, that's always a difficult question to answer because you're kind of comparing apples and oranges. Um, the way we rate difficulty for EVA, obviously um, the station, the changing out the joint, while it might seem straightforward, there's a lot of risk and it's a very critical EVA. Um, we need the station arm to continue assembly build. So to compare the criticality of the hardware that we're working on or to compare um, high torques that the crew members must input, it's difficult to say. Um, I will say that our EVA-1 is probably the most basic of our three. EVA-2 gets a little more challenging, and EVA-3 is probably the most challenging. Okay, let's go to the Kennedy Space Center for questions. This is Phil Chen with Earth News. Um, I assume that the Lee, once you remove it, it's going to be tethered to somebody or something while you move it over to, to the body ratchet tether, uh, just in case to <laughs> make sure it doesn't go anywhere. And what benefit do you have uh, to uh, putting it on a PFR in the lab versus the original concept of having the Lee grab uh, the PMA uh, to uh, grapple fix or something like that so it's already uh, hard, hard made it to something uh, before uh, doing your operations on it? Okay, the first question, um, Philippe is very, very conscious, they both are, of always tethering to tools. This is no different um, because it's such a large object and we are very careful about it. He's actually using two tethers. So um, he will always be tethered to the Lee when he's moving it and holding onto it with a scoop. Um, he remains positively tethered to it until we have it installed on Destiny in the, in the foot restraint and the tool stack up for how it is being stowed on the uh, foot restraint on Destiny. 
The scoop I mentioned earlier, the handling device, will be first attached to a micro fixture on the lee. Then Franklin will have, um, we already have pre-positioned the ball stack, which is basically a rigid tether. And that has um, another acronym, an ECOM fitting, EVA changeout mechanism. We have all these great tools that we've never been able to use, uh, some of the options of for space station, and it's um, a generic way of um, attaching the ball stack to the foot restraint. So Franklin will be there to help guide that scoop that's already on the lee um, onto, the, onto the ball stack. So the total order is scoop to lee, ball stack to scoop, and then foot restraint to uh, ball stack. Once they attach it, then they'll also use um, a tether. Again, we want to be kind of belt and suspenders, doubly safe, to attach the lead to the handrail on Destiny. This bone is attached to the arm bone, the arm bone is attached to the shoulder bone. Yeah. Um, if I keep kept track on what suits are going where, uh, you're launching the, the two, two largest, which will become Corzin and Tresh left suit, and I guess. Uh, Peggy gets the medium-sized suit that's uh, already on board, that's Dan Birch's suit. And uh, I guess reading between the lines, you're implying that all the EVAs on Expedition 5 uh, for the increment stage will be uh, out of Orlans. They, they don't have any planned um, EVAs using EMUs. Your summary was exactly right. Okay, that actually makes sense. Uh, and for the EDFs, uh, uh, do you have a hard requirement that you have to have all 12 uh, latch down, uh, tighten all the way to 25 foot pound force uh, when uh, you're finished, or can you get away with one or two of them uh, um, uh, untorqued to down uh, and still uh, be acceptable? That's a great question. Actually, the requirement is five of six. So any five of six EDF torque would be sufficient. Um, that also holds true for the uh, fail join in the payload bay that we're returning. It interfaces to the payload bay with a kind of lug interface also, and so five of six are good there. If we got into some kind of contingency situation and we wanted to just quickly save the system and still drive the electrical mate demate to provide power to either the joint or the end effector, we only need three EDFs in that case. Um, this would require another EVA, obviously, to go back and get the remaining three, but we could at least um, drive the electrical uh, connectors and provide power. Hi, it's Jim Banky with Space.com. Uh, would you please elaborate a little bit on the different source of oxygen for pre-breathing? I'm not sure I understood exactly why you're going to a shuttle source. Is it at all related to the electron issues of late? And uh, if you're doing the pre-breathe, are you doing it in the shuttle? And can you still do the accelerated pre-breathe? Do they have the equipment set up to do that in there? Okay, um, it has nothing to do with electron. We've been planning this for a couple of weeks now. What it has to do with is something called the ORCA or the Oxygen Recharge Compressor Assembly. It's the compressor that is used to, um, when we transfer oxygen from the space shuttle to the space station, and that's who, what um, piece of hardware had its life limited. And so we're trying to do our job by um, reducing the amount of cycles we actually need to run the ORCA. And instead of transferring the oxygen to the high-pressure gas tanks and then using it from there, we are just bypassing that by using the oxygen directly from the space shuttle. Uh, the crew will still be in the station, and we will just be using really long um, 60 to 90 foot cable or uh, hoses configured back to the shuttle. So they will still do their nominal pre-brief protocol. Um, to them, once the mask is on, it'll be transparent where the oxygen is coming from. Um, Todd Halverson, New York Times. Um, could you refresh my memory on what exactly the problem was on 8A that led to the EVA task and, and maybe elaborate on how that task fixes the problem? I'm sorry, I don't know which task you're referring to um, on 8A. The, uh, well, the cable cutter task that you're doing on this one. Right. Um, there's a cable cutter on either side of the mobile transporter. They launched in place on 8A. One of the, um, both of them have something called a spacing bolt, and this prevents a guillotine mechanism from coming down and um, cutting off the trailing umbilical system, the cable that trails the mobile transporter that provides power, data, and video to the mobile transporter. This is just a nice feature that if it were to get stuck, originally it was designed so that we wouldn't have to send an EVA crew member to go out and either cut the cable or disconnect it. 
Well, on the Nader side of um, the mobile transporter on 8A, the safety bolt was not able to completely come out, and they don't know the reason why, and it's not a, rare, a real clear-cut answer. So that unit is suspect. That cable cutting mechanism is suspect. On the Xena side, which is the one that we're going to reinstall, the crew was able to successfully withdraw that safing bolt. And the program's just being very conservative. Since we don't know what's wrong on the Nader side, we want to go back and safe the system on the Xena side. So that's what Franklin will be doing after he attaches the MBS to MT bolts. He'll go back and just turn in one bolt, seven turns. Um, we no longer would have the guillotine cutting capability um, on the trailing umbilical, but we also know that we wouldn't accidentally cut that trailing umbilical. Thanks. Um, and on the, the wrist roll joint, if for one reason or another problems cropped up and EBA3 disappeared off, off the flight plan, where would you stow the wrist roll joint? Would you temp stow it outside or would you bring it inside? No, we would definitely bring the wrist roll joint inside. We'd want to keep it um, in a thermally uh, comfortable environment. We'd also um, want to make sure that nothing gets into electrical connectors that would be exposed if you left it outside. So we have um, our stowage folks preparing just in case a backup plan where we would bring it. And if we knew that we had to bring it inside, the crew has been trained to translate it back to the airlock. Um, being very careful with it and uh, bringing it inside for a future crew to install. Uh, this is Ocean. Let's go back to the size of uh, this joint. Uh, it looks like about the size of, say, a 13-inch uh, TV set or a computer monitor or a larger or a smaller. What, if it was a computer monitor, what, what would be the diagonal on the screen? Um, probably 17-inch monitor. That, that's probably a good analogy. It's, um, I could get you the exact dimensions, but it's probably about a foot and a half long and about a foot in diameter. If you saw the video earlier, it's the same diameter as the yaw joint that we um, showed in the video. Okay, that's it down at the Cape. Uh, we're back here for any follow-ups. Marsha? Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Um, how many cables do you need to hook up when you attach the MBS? We attach um, six connectors for video and data, and then we attach two for power, so a total of eight. Okay. And um, for the debris shields, uh, about how big of a package is that in, in terms of handling? I mean, is that is that bulky or? Um, actually, on the debris shields, there's six of them, and they're all held together by Russian wire ties. Like it's a copper piece of, um, just a piece of copper about this big, and they have a bracket on the side that they twist around. There's also a Russian handrail on the side of um, one of the shields. There's two, one on each side. So that's what Franklin, while he's being maneuvered by Valeri up to the PMA, he'll just hold the Russian handrail so it's not so bad. And also he's on the end of the arm, so it makes it easier. Okay. Uh, Dave Santucci, CNN. Um, how long are the windows, how much time do you have um, before you have thermal problems with the MBS and with the wrist roll joint? As far as, uh, you know, not being powered up, when do you have to have them powered up by? Well, for the MBS, the MBS is always being powered because it's getting power through the station arm. So as long as we're in the configuration either right above the bay or right above the mobile transporter, we're fine. Um, again, as uh, I think Rick mentioned earlier, the limiting factor on the MBS is that claw it doesn't have a heater on it. So we want to get it to a thermally um, nice environment. Once it's installed on the MT, um, it could stay there indefinitely just on the claw and having the station arm supply power. Obviously, you wouldn't be able to use the station arm for anything else, so that's why our first task on EVA2 is to hook up the utilities to get the power transferred. Um, and I'm sorry, what was your second no, part of your question? The wrist roll joint. Oh, the wrist roll joint. The wrist roll joint, the new one, flies up um, in the payload bay, and the folks at the Cape have actually been able to route a heater pad to that piece of sidewall carrier, to that piece of hardware. So um, we actually apply in such a good attitude, they don't think they'll even need that heater. It also has a thermal blanket. So um, as far as the joint change out goes, we're really okay. Um, what's the limiting factor is that camera on the end effector that we remove because that's going to be the one piece of hardware that will never see power until we reassemble the station arm. 
Okay, I think that's all the questions. Good afternoon and welcome to the STS-111 crew briefing for the next mission to the International Space Station. Today we'll begin with some introductions and comments about the mission and then we'll take your questions. I'd like to introduce first of all Commander Ken Cockrell, who's a veteran shuttle commander and uh, comes to us with a degree from uh, the University of Texas as well as a graduate degree in aeronautical systems from the University of West, Flor West Florida. He's a former naval aviator and test pilot with some 8,000 flight hours and over 650 carrier landings. He entered the Astronaut Corps in 1991 and is a veteran of four missions, SDS 56, 69, 80, and 98. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ken. Thanks, Doug. I'd like to start off by saying that we've got one of those missions that, got, that has almost too much in it to get done. So we're, uh, we're looking forward to a very um, jam-packed timeline when we get on orbit. And uh, aside from the normal excitement of launch, landing, and docking and undocking, we've got a tremendous amount of work to do while we're, while we're docked to the International Space Station. When we're docked to Alpha, we've got three EVAs to pull off, one of which we've only been training for for the last month, which is the launch on need repair of the, uh, the major, the big arm on the space station, Canada Arm 2, and two other previously planned assembly EVAs. We have uh, a crew exchange, as you can tell by Expedition 5 sitting next to us here, and we'll be bringing back Expedition 4, who by all accounts are enjoying themselves very much up there and also very much looking forward to us getting there. And then we have a very full MPLM with 15 of the 16 rack spots taken up and with hopes of filling it to 90% of capacity uh, for return, which will unload uh, sort of a backlog of excess uh, supplies and equipment on board space station that really needs to be removed because the next MPLM flight is not until next January. So we have a, a full plate in front of us, and uh, we've, we've been working hard to, to make especially the, uh, the transfer, um, most especially the return transfer, the things that we load aboard the MPLM to bring back, go as smoothly as possible so that hopefully we can be successful on all fronts. Um, in our crew, we, uh, at launch, we'll have a crew of seven. We are integrating the Expedition 5 crew into our activities for the first three days of, of flight. And, uh, but of this crew of seven, only two of us have been on shuttle before. So it's gonna be uh, very interesting and somewhat entertaining for Franklin and I to watch the other five when we first get to orbit. And we'll also have a, a pretty busy time getting everybody a place to sleep and, and uh, everything squared away in preparation for the first full day on orbit when we first get there. So. It's going to be fun from that aspect. It's always fun to watch the rookies flail a little bit when they get to orbit. Speaking of rookies, uh, next to me is my pilot, uh, Paul Lockhart. I didn't bring a bio, uh, Doug, so I can't do the same that you did for me, but Paco was in the 1996 class of astronauts, the, uh, the uh, famous uh, sardine class because there were so many of them. I think approximately 44,000 were hired that year. <laughs> and uh, he's waited a while for his first flight. Uh, he has worked extremely hard to, uh, to, to be ready above and beyond the amount of readiness that's required for a shuttle flight. And, and I don't expect anything short of perfection out of Paul because of the way uh, the extra hours he's put in. And uh, his wife has told me all about those. Uh, they're really not all my fault, Paco, but... Uh, Paco's going to be sitting in the right seat. He's a uh, Air Force pilot uh, and test pilot and uh, a great compliment to this crew. And I'm just going to go down the line and introduce everybody, and then after that we can start with the questions. Next to Paco is a fellow uh, sardine, uh, Philippe Perron. Uh, Philippe, or Pepe as we call him, is also making his first flight. He's serving as uh, MS-1, be on the flight deck for ascent. He's going to uh, take care of the Expedition 4 crew on the mid-deck uh, on our return to Earth. So he'll be on the mid-deck uh, in seat number five for entry. Uh, Philippe is also EVA crew member. He's EV2. And on our newest, uh, our latest assigned uh, EVA, the one where we repair the Canada Arm 2, Philippe does a lot of the 
a lot of the work and he gets to ride the shuttle arm uh, and using one robotic system to repair the other is going to be kind of an interesting thing and he's going to be the human link between those two arms. Philippe's also making his first flight and will be part of our entertainment uh, first day on orbit. Next to Philippe is Franklin who told NASA's administrator a few days ago that he's only on his fourth flight. Uh, and, and the administrator was actually checking his records to see where the error was. He, he believed as he hasn't really gotten to know me that well. And Franklin is truly on his seventh flight. And uh, as I think I told uh, some of you down in KSC a few days ago, uh, he's going to be the first person that's not a grandfather to make uh, seven flights in space. Franklin is uh, MS2, so he'll be serving as a flight engineer for ascent and entry. He's also EV, EV1, the leader of uh, and the, the master of the uh, three EVAs that we have. And uh, looking forward to watching a pro in operation when we get to orbit. Next to Franklin is commander of Expedition 5, Valery Korzun, uh, originally a Russian Air Force pilot and a cosmonaut, veteran of a Mir space flight, um, one of the few people that's had to fight a fire in orbit. I like to think that uh, he put out the fire that Jerry Leninger started. That's not exactly correct. It was a, a mishap that started the fire, but Valeri had to had to uh, deal with that fire. So he's he's had experience in routine as well as emergency spaceflight, and uh, he's actually our other uh, professional or uh, experienced guy on the flight. Um, but it's his first time in shuttle, so there may be some entertainment value there too. Next to Valeri is uh, Peggy Whitson. Peggy uh, is going to be doing uh, the, some of the robotics ops for this flight. She'll be installing the uh, mobile base system, our piece of assembly hardware that's going up with us, and uh, along with Valeri operating the arm for all the operations that we do. Valeri will be doing the EVA support for EVA number one. Peggy's making her first flight, and uh, she is another one, along with Paco and Philippe, that have worked extremely hard to make their first flight uh, look like one that they've done before, and I, that's what I fully expect. Finally, next to Peggy is uh, uh, Sergey Treshov, and Sergey is just uh, he's a consummate gentleman and the most polite man I think you can come across. Uh, he's been a, a tremendous friend and, and, a, and a great guy to have around while we're in training. And he's also making his first flight, flight engineer aboard ISS, and uh, looking forward to spending at least the first, um, I guess, 10 days or 11 days with uh, Sergey, Peggy, and Valeri on orbit. Looking forward to a great time with these guys. And I've really enjoyed training with you and, and sharing office with you for this last uh, year. So it's so almost sorry to see this flight begin because it means the ending of it. Well, with that, uh, and there's probably some I've left out about um, most of these guys, but let's uh, go ahead with the questions, and we'll fill in more later. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, thank you. This is uh, Mark Caro from the Houston Chronicle. And uh, my, my question is for Franklin Chang Diaz. I wonder if you might uh, talk a little bit about what's been so compelling about being an astronaut professionally, what's kept you going for seven flights, and uh, do you intend to do seven more, or? <laughs> yeah, I'm just getting started. <laughs> Actually, um, being an astronaut is, uh, has been a dream of my life ever since I was very little. And uh, I did um, try to make that dream come true, uh, with obviously successfully. And I'm hoping that uh, perhaps uh, this is uh, in the minds of many other children uh, as we open up space for uh, human exploration that uh, many other children all over the world will have the opportunity to also dream about it and, and uh, someday realize those dreams. Um, since you are one of the few people who has traveled or will travel seven times, um, do you, are you disappointed at all in, in where the space program has progressed in the time that you've been an astronaut or do you feel Maybe that uh, most of us sort of overlook how far it's, it's really kind of come in that time. Well, you know, I guess uh, I, I tend to be a little philosophical about that. Uh, 
Of course, uh, we all feel that uh, we could be much further, but uh, then again, uh, there are other things going on in this planet beyond just the exploration of space. There are a lot of other issues that our leaders have to deal with and prioritize and realize you know, how the resources are to be allocated. Um, we have uh, come a long way uh, since the beginning of the shuttle program, and uh, now we are in the mid middle of the assembly of the space station uh, with tremendous success up to this point, uh, in spite of uh, a lot of the um, arguments and discussions regarding the cost. Technically, the project has been a remarkable success, like uh, no other uh, in, in history. So I think um, overall, uh, I feel comfortable that we are where we are, and we are happy with that. Uh, we would like to make it go further, uh, move faster, and we push in that direction, and perhaps uh, that will happen. But uh, we need to be aware of what's going on around us at the same time. Yeah, Marsha Dunn, Associated Press, um, probably for the commander. Um, I'm wondering if, in talking with the Expedition 4 crew, that they're just dying to get hold of something or eat something, or do they just don't want to wait till landing. Is there anything you're taking up to, to sort of um, give them a, 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 a taste or a look of what's awaiting them on Earth, and, and perhaps you could talk about any special dinners you plan and, and that sort of thing? We have planned a few special things. Um, the uh, shuttle food menu has really uh, grown in, in uh, its size and variety in the past few years especially. I think as we've uh, have striven to give the expedition crews a bigger variety. So we found a way to have um, a Mexican day, an Asian day, a, a surf and turf day, and a Cajun day uh, with, within the, the boundaries of the, the uh, shuttle food menu. And we brought enough of that uh, in reserve to uh, make have have a meal for everybody aboard. So we'll have some festivities associated with that. It's always good to come together as a group of ten and and have a have a meal together. Really uh, serves to recharge the batteries and make you ready for the rest of the day or the rest of the dark time. So we do look forward to doing that. And in addition, um, I'm sure they haven't had anything fresh uh, since the last flight to visit them, Hunt 110. So we'll bring uh, a little bit of fruit along and some chocolates, uh, things like that that I'm sure they've run out of by now. And the fact that they've been up there for six months, um, are any of you going to have the time, given the busy schedule, to really just make sure they're okay physically, uh, you know, and, and for the descent again? You know, it's a long time that they have felt gravity. so. Sure. How, how, how's that going to, is there going to be anything different on during entry, uh, given the fact they've been up there for a record time amount of time for at least the U.S.? Right. Um, well, the, the flight will be sort of in two phases in terms of business. As while we're docked to the station, we will not have time to regard anything having to do with entry. We'll just be so busy getting the transfer complete and running all the EVAs and doing the assembly operations. Once we undock, though, the, the timeline will obviously, the focus of the mission will take a big shift. And we're going to have a dress rehearsal with them for getting suited for entry. Uh, as we told you before, we're going to have one of our crew members on the mid-deck with them to, to uh, take care of any needs they have, especially post-landing uh, before the hatch is opened. And uh, they will also follow the expedition, the ISS crew protocol for uh, exercise and fluid loading for entry which will be slightly different than the shuttle one, um, and, and we'll just uh, assist them in following that. But we'll, I think, mainly just preparing them, talking about it, and doing the stress rehearsal for getting suited up will be the main focus of our helping them. Uh, Dave Santucci with CNN. Um, my question is more for the Expedition 5 crew. Um, during the handoff period, what, uh, how much time are you given to really learn the things that they're uh, the little nuances that you know you might not be familiar with of uh, up there. How much time every day you're going to be able to work on your handoff? You know, handoff. Uh, this is important things, but uh, this is not main task because main task. Uh, this is uh, provide task uh, for UF2 flight. I mean, <coughs> uh, unload and load and MPLM and uh, made MBS and provide EVA one, two, three. And 
of course, uh, most of all, uh, main time it will take a lot of MPLM and activity for EVA. But if we each uh, free time, three minutes, we will have, uh, we will use for Honduras. But, uh, you know, uh, we have now a uh, big picture of a station and uh, we have special uh, flight data file for this activity. And uh, uh, I think I am ready for handle for 50% and I will just only ask previous crew question what I need to know about system and uh, I think it will be more easier for us. And we use uh, video which uh, Expedition 4 sent us with previous uh, shuttle flight. And now we try to to, uh, to prepare for this uh, task uh, on the ground uh, as more as possible. Okay, do we have any other questions here at Johnson Station? All right, not seeing any, uh, we'll move on to uh, NASA headquarters. Tracy Watson with USA Today for the Expedition 5 members. Will you be doing anything differently aboard the station because of lessons learned during, by the first four crews, especially with regard to exercise and, and keeping in, in good shape in zero G? Well, I think uh, one of the things that we have learned is that our crews are coming down in a lot better shape than we anticipated, maybe better than what they uh, had returned to Earth after the shuttle mirror missions. And we do think our exercise protocols are working very well. Um, so in particular, resistive exercise, I think they've seen less bone loss in those crew members who have been doing more uh, resistive exercise. So I think that we have a, a taken the initial steps and we know that some of those steps are effective and so I think we will be continuing the exercise program as much as we can feasibly uh, conduct it. So. Francis Deman with Asian Force Press. Uh, question for Franklin and uh, Philip. Uh, given the short amount of time you had to prepare for the third EVA, are you confident you can pull out um, this task um, um, well enough? Yeah, uh, there is no uh, there is no doubt about that because um, actually that third EVA is uh, is very simple. Um, it's going to be a long EVA because we have a lot of bolts to deal with and bolt and rebolting them. But as far as the uh, the hardware that we need to uh, to change, it's pretty simple. When you look at it, it looks like a major surgery because we're going to take the uh, end of the arm out and then uh, swap the joints and then uh, get the um, the lead back uh, back on place and we have to run against the, the clock and do everything um, in an orderly and timely fashion but uh, it's going to be a long EVA but uh, I think quite simple so we have had uh, more than the, than we need uh, we've been in the pool uh, almost every other day uh, the last uh, three weeks and uh, I'm really glad the way um, the training and everybody in the uh, engineering world reacted that request, that late request. Uh, we've seen the, the Canadian Space Agency doing a, an amazing job. I mean, their initial design is really well thought in terms of being able to um, to be um, uh, changed on the, on the late request. And I feel very confident about the amount of training that we've had. Uh, I can tell you that uh, it has been a, a lot of time spent in the pool lately. That's, that's for sure. I have a follow-up for Philip. Uh, Philip, this is going to be a lot of first for you. This is going to be your first uh, space flight, uh, first uh, walk in space, and I understand you're going to be also the first European to assemble um, a piece of the space station. Ten days before the launch, um, what is your state of mind? Are you uh, excited? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, I don't know if I should answer in English or in French for the French media, but. Um I think it's, uh, it's funny because everybody is asking me if I feel excited and what I try to do is not to feel too excited because of course I am. But uh, at that point I mean uh, it's about time to uh, stay focused and uh, keep the training. We have one uh, full more a week and uh, we have still a lot to review. So I went from being an astronaut as um, basically the project of a life and a kind of a dream come through like, uh, like Franklin 
where, to the point where now I feel uh, very more um, uh, loaded by uh, technical details and I feel that I have a mission to do. So right now um, I focus more on the mission and uh, I'll take time to enjoy the flight uh, maybe when I'm there or maybe when I come back. All right, I believe those uh, are all the questions we have from NASA headquarters. Now we'll move to Kennedy Space Flight Center. Hi, Peter King with CBS News Radio. We'll start out with Commander Cockrell. Um, and uh, we want you to talk a little bit about uh, your uh, crewmate, Franklin, without embarrassing him too much. Obviously, seven times uh, is, is tying the record, and there must be something really appealing about having this guy on your crew. What are some of the attributes that, uh, that keep him flying so often? Well, the number one attribute is uh, professional competence. Franklin is well known, well respected for his uh, consummate abilities and consummate knowledge of the space shuttle and its systems. So he's a, he's a perfect guy to have as a mission specialist number two, the flight engineer. He knows my job, he knows Paco's job, and uh, he, he backs us up and directs us and guides us in, uh, in every way having to do with the, the technical side of shuttle flying. He's also a guy that uh, takes to space very well from all accounts. I haven't flown with him before, but uh, he, he doesn't get sick and he's, uh, he's a natural at uh, move, maneuvering around in zero G. And uh, he puts together a pretty good meal. Uh, he does so at least on Earth, so I'm expecting uh, some good use of the menu items on board shuttle. So on just about every front having to do with uh, living life on the space shuttle, Franklin's going to be a, a great guy to have on the crew. For uh, Philippe, since uh, you're going to be on the end of the arm and you're going to be handling that uh, wrist roll joint, I'm just wondering, can you give us an idea of the size of that and how difficult uh, it might be to handle or, won't, or don't you think it'll be difficult to handle up there? Yeah, I'll let you know when, uh, when we come back. I think I have a pretty good idea now. We've got a sophisticated way to... Uh, basically simulate that task. Uh, one of the ways is the, uh, the pool here at the NBL. Another way is to deal with the uh, real, um, uh, I mean, uh, virtual reality, and we've done a lot of that lately, and uh, NASA is, um, is really um, putting a lot of effort on that uh, new technology. Another way is also to uh, simulate the mass handling by basically uh, putting you on a, an air bearing floor and having everything looking the same as if you were handling the, the, the mass on orbit. So I think it's not going to be um, too delicate. Now, the, this hardware is um, robust. I mean, the interface is very robust. Now, uh, if you look at the hardware, it has some uh, very fragile um, pieces, uh, some of the avionic, uh, some of the, the camera, the lenses, and also uh, some uh, radiator of a very special uh, cutting. So I'm going to have to be very gentle uh, when I uh, manipulate that, that piece. I need to keep that piece away from my mini workstation. We've seen, uh, you've seen people in space and how many tools we have. I think uh, we've, got, we've got quite a few on, the, on that mission too. So it's a lot of um, objects that I need to get away from the, the equipment when I'm dealing with it. But it should be a pretty uh, simple task. Can you give us an idea of just how big that piece of hardware is? Um, I mean, um, I'm at that point confused with um, metric systems and, um, and feet and inches and pounds and everything, but um, basically the joint is about that, that big and the, uh, the lee is about that big, at least in the pool with the uh, deformation of the, the helmet. So it may be in space, it's going to be slightly different. Way to show them on the radio. And, and my last question is for <laughs> Commander Cockrell. This absolutely has nothing to do with your flight, but everything to do with international uh, uh, space cooperation, commerce, if you will. Uh, one of the lead Chinese space scientists was quoted in one of the uh, Chinese newspapers today as saying they want to send a manned trip to the moon by 2010. I'm just wondering your thoughts on that, if you have any knowledge at all about their program, and, and maybe in general just how easy or difficult it is to do a task like that in uh, eight years or less. Well, the United States did a task uh, exactly like that in about eight years, so it's uh, certainly possible to do. Uh, and, and they're starting about from where we were starting when uh, President Kennedy gave us a mandate to go to the moon. 
and that is they haven't put a man in orbit yet uh, on one of their own systems. So they've got a long way to go, but we've shown in the past that, and in the 1960s that it can be done. Uh, it'd be great if we could get uh, them on board with us and maybe infuse some of their enthusiasm and, and some of their technical know-how and some of their um, resources into a, a global program to go to the moon and, and even further. That would be the good thing. For uh, Paco and Taco, uh, this is Phil Chen, Earth News. Uh, I'm not sure if we should be concerned or happy, but this will be the first shuttle flight with uh, two pilots from Texas. Um, any, any thoughts about that? Anything special you guys going to do to commemorate it? Well, thanks, Phil. You gave me the, uh, the, the tough question to answer right here about Taco and myself being from Texas. Well, it not only goes uh, that we're both from Texas, but we both attended the University of Texas, and so we both have the same background. And, I think that kind of explains why uh, uh, Taco and I uh, have a little bit of uh, simpatico between us right there. Uh, I'm getting to the point where uh, Taco looks at me and uh, I uh, pretty well know what he wants me to do or not do. So uh, perhaps a little bit of that Texas background uh, coming through there. But uh, beyond that, uh, um, whether Taco came from the northeast part of the United States, southwest, north, whatever, um, you know, I've put a lot of... Uh, uh, faith uh, in his abilities, and he's the person I uh, look to when I want to know how things are done properly. Well, I'll buy Taco. Uh, what do you think of Paco's job, even if he uh, chose to go Air Force instead of Navy? <laughs> well, I'll forgive him his early uh, errors in judgment because he finally got to the right place, and I look forward to seeing him fly in another pilot flight and, and many flights in the left seat of the orbiter. He's going to do great. And for Franklin Chang Diaz, if we don't count 61C because that KU one's about to be retired, if we don't count Galileo, uh, SCS-34, because Galileo is about to end its mission, and if we count the two tether missions as a single flight because uh, it was the same payload, uh, I suppose we can get you down to four flights. Um, <laughs> just wondering a real curious item. Um, I noticed you were wearing braces, and uh, that's usually a young person's <laughs> thing. Are you trying to pre pretend that you're younger, and uh, will you be the first person to fly in space with braces? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I will be the first one with braces, but I can tell you they're pretty painful, and it's, it's hard to talk at this at this moment. But you know, the spacewalk is the uh, world of silence, so I don't think you're going to have much to talk there. Jerry Hannah from Time Magazine. This is for um, Dr. Chang Diaz, and uh, first uh, made a scoopy because. Uh, I was reminded by Dr. Whitman that she's not really the first person to fly in space with, with a patent. My question uh, is, are, do you feel a bit over, just a tad overtasked in this, in this mission? It seems very, very busy. Um, no, not really. I, I feel that uh, it's just the right amount. Uh, it is a challenging uh, set of um, orders that we have in our plate, and uh, we will execute them uh, as we have been trained. Uh, it is not just me, uh, but uh, you know we are operating as a team, and uh, that is what makes it all uh, work out. Uh, the fact that we all depend on one another to. Uh, make things happen. Uh, we all back each other up, and uh, so in that respect, I think we have uh, just the right amount of, uh, of tasks uh, ahead of us. Okay, I understand that that was the last question from Kennedy Space Center, so we'll return here to Johnson, and uh, do we have any final questions? Final questions today. Here we have one right here. I have a question for Ken. Uh, how do you manage such a diverse team with rookies and very experienced astronauts at the same time? How have I managed? Uh, yes. Do you do you see any difficulties, specific difficulties? Well, I, I think I, having a mix of uh, experience and, and rookiness is, is the right way to go. you got to bring uh, I think it's important to have have the new blood in, in an organization and in a flight. Um, as I told you before, it's really entertaining to have the new guys on a flight, so that's fun for the, uh, the experienced guys. Uh, and so I think having the experience as well as the, um, the rookies sort of, it's a yin and the yang. It balances things. The, the experienced guys 
know what's going to happen and, and can lead the new guys along, but maybe they're also a little bit set in their ways and maybe haven't uh, seen something from the same perspective a new guy has when he gets there. Uh, so I think uh, new guys often teach the old guys something uh, when you get to orbit. So I, I think it's a great thing to do. I, I've been on all experienced crews. I've been on crews with one rookie. This is the first time I've been on a crew that has more rookies than experience. So I might change my answer when I get back, but <laughs> right now I'm really looking forward to it. All right, Marcia. Yeah, I'm Marcia Dunn, Associated Press for uh, Colonel Lockhart and Colonel Perrin. Perrin. <laughs> um, you both are Air Force pilots, and I'm wondering if you could sort of talk about how you went from being Air Force pilot to astronaut. Um, did you get into flying just to be an astronaut, or did this sort of evolve uh, over a period of years? Well, that's a good question. It's, it's one that's usually asked by uh, you know, an eight-year-old in a sense, because they, they look at me with wonder in their eyes a lot of times. So it's, a, it's an excellent question because it allows me to speak to all types of people. And the answer is, uh, yes, I did join the Air Force at the time because I was interested in going to NASA. But as I always like to point out, the, the journey to get to NASA through the military has been just as rewarding to me as actually being here at NASA at this time. Um, you ask uh, both myself and Philippe uh, about about the Air Force and, and how how it's affected us. And I'm going to say in a very positive manner, and it's interesting because uh, Pepe and I, in a sense, share the same background. Um, I was stationed in Germany in the 1980s uh, with our forces over there and uh, were, was flying in squadrons there in, in support of NATO. And I didn't know, but uh, Pepe, and I'm sure he can relate a little bit more, was uh, coincidentally doing the same thing. So it's really interesting that our paths have uh, come together, diverged, and now come back together here in Houston in the same flight. And um, the um, interesting thing is that uh, Valeri was doing the same thing, the exact same thing on the other side at that time of the border, <laughs> and now on our side. And I think that's uh, the best part of that international uh, effort. Um, to answer the, uh, the question about the background, that was my best surprise when I came here in, uh, in Houston to realize that how, uh, how many people basically had the same background made me feel very uh, comfortable. It was more than that because I understood that that background really led to uh, space flight. I mean, we've got people with technical background like, like Franklin, Peggy, uh, Sergey, and we've got people with our background, but it's something very common. And we are talking the same language, we are talking about the same things. I was in the Gulf War when most of the astronauts uh, of my age were in the Gulf War. I was in the no-fly zone when most of the astronauts of my age were in the no-fly zone. And I would be over uh, Pakistan like um, the, my, my uh, fellows from the, the Air Force, French Air Force, are now if I was still in the Air Force. So it's really the same family that uh, uh, I, I had been through already and I knew very well through some common exercise that I, I, um, I saw when I first came in Houston. All right, uh, that'll uh, be the last question for today, and that'll conclude our STS-111 uh, series of briefings today.